Up next, it's a hearing held in Washington two weeks ago to examine product packaging and how it affects the environment. Members of the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Transportation and Hazardous Materials met to hear from several marketing and industry representatives, including Jason Berman of the Recording Industry Association of America and environmentalists and representatives of several citizens' groups. Among the issues before the panel is unnecessary packaging, whether the packaging is biodegradable, and the relationship between industry and environmental concerns in using environmentally sound packaging materials. Subcommittee will come to order. Good morning. I'd like to welcome the subcommittee members along with our witnesses and guests to the fourth of the subcommittee's hearings leading to RICRA reauthorization. The subcommittee will focus its attention on the problem of packaging in this hearing and its role in the nation's solid waste problem. <clears throat> Discussions on waste reduction and recycling often focus on packaging. This is not surprising, for according to EPA, containers and packaging comprise the largest single product category generated in municipal solid waste by weight at roughly 32 percent of all the waste generated, and second in terms of volume. Moreover, unlike, unlike most other products, packaging enters the waste stream almost immediately. As in recycling, state and local governments have taken the lead in trying to address the issue of packaging waste through packaging bans, packaging taxes, and other measures. However, their task is not an easy one. It's difficult to regulate products that move through interstate commerce on a city-by-city -city or state-by-state -state basis. As the state and local recycling officials who testified at the subcommittee's first RICRA hearing told us there, there is a role for the federal government in addressing the issue of packaging wastes. There are several issues the subcommittee hopes to explore in this hearing. For example, what is excess packaging? In some instances, the perfume in the bottle, uh, in the paper, and in the bag, and in the box uh, all seems like an obvious example of uh, carrying a good thing too far. But others may not be so obvious. What criteria are most important in making environmentally conscious packaging decisions? Should we be looking beyond solid waste concerns to a wider range of environmental impacts? And what is the role in all of this of the consumer? Ultimately, it may come down to consumer behavior in determining the success of packaging uh, redesign and meeting environmental goals. Thus, educating the consumer is an important component in the waste reduction strategy. However, without standardized definitions for terms such as recycled or biodegradable seen on products with increasing frequency, consumers have no basis for making objective comparisons between different products. What should the federal government be doing to achieve some uniformity? Packaging designers have proven themselves able to meet the challenge of designing a package that performs a variety of functions, including product protection, information dissemination, and convenience during the package's use. However, the time is here for packaging designers to begin thinking also about what happens to the package after it's used. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing will address several issues related to packaging and labeling. Packaging must serve a range of important functions for literally millions of different products. These functions include protection of the product during transportation and storage, preventing spoilage, theft prevention, child-proofing, safety, and use as a dispenser. In short, packaging design must be as unique as the millions of products we Americans purchase each day. And I might add that America leads the world in creativity in, in packaging. And we sell uh, our products here and abroad uh, in a global economy, in an increasingly global economy, to some extent because of the creativity of the way we put it out, the way we put it together. A lot of jobs are related to that whole industry. However, according to EPA, packaging and containers constitute roughly one-third of America's solid waste and thus contribute to the need for new landfills as well as the interstate shipment of waste. 
consistent with the other important functions of packaging, American industry needs to minimize the volume of packaging and use recyclable materials where possible. The packaging guidelines from the Council of Northeastern Governors, or CONEG, are an excellent starting point. Many major companies have accepted the CONEG challenge to review their packaging practices in light of the resource conservation and recovery goals that all Americans must embrace to continue a robust free market economy and wisely manage our natural resources. Concerns have also been raised over toxic constituents in some packaging, particularly heavy metals and inks and plastics. I would hope that today's witnesses will give us some idea of the levels of risk associated with such toxic constituents in packaging and any current steps being taken to reduce these risks. The level of risk should guide us in deciding whether we should devote scarce governmental resources to this issue. If the levels of risk are extremely low and positive steps are currently being taken, perhaps we should not embrace new and resource intensive command and control approaches but look to other methods of reducing heavy metals in the waste stream. Manufacturers, local governments, and environmental groups have all urged the need for standard national definitions for environmental claims on products and packages. Terms such as recyclable must carry a common meaning to allow American consumers to shop wisely and promote efficient recycling operations. I understand that one of the leading environmental groups and one of the leading industry trade associations has recently come to some very uh, substantive compromises. I hope today's witnesses will enlighten the committee on how to best use environmental labeling and promote an appropriate partnership between industry, environmental groups, and federal, state, and local governments. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses concerning these important issues and again commend the chairman for a RICRA process designed to build a strong and thorough record based on fact from which Congress can craft thoughtful legislation. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Recognize the gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you, the staff, uh, and ranking member Mr. Ritter for uh, uh, important hearing and following the, uh, the uh, uh, making sure that packaging is reduced, making sure it's non-toxic, and making sure that, uh, that uh, green labels mean something. Those are all important. I have a statement I'd like to be placed in the record. It would make your heart flutter. It's so beautiful, but I'll, I'll uh, spare you uh, uh, spare you that. I do want to uh, okay. We do want to welcome a couple of Minnesotans. Uh, uh, Steve Kramer, a city council member of Minneapolis, will be on the uh, third panel. He he has been the uh, author of uh, packaging initiatives in Minneapolis that spurred the whole state to take action in his authority throughout the uh, the country. Uh, legislative. Uh, uh, authority on uh, packaging and uh, uh, Kurt Johnson who is executive director of the uh, Citizens League in, in, a, in Minnesota has done tremendous work on a whole host of issues. He's chaired the our governor's uh, select committee on packaging environment. Both of them will share with the subcommittee uh, what Minnesota initiatives uh, have uh, have been taken and in, in what they what they're producing uh, with that I thank you I have to apologize I'm chairing uh, uh, gaveling my own hearing on civil service uh, federal employee protection so I'll be missing most of it but I'll read and make my heart flutter all the other testimony well I, I will read your uh, your opening statement too because uh, I need a heart flutter from time. That's right. <laughs> would the chairman yield? Certainly. <laughs> now I'm that the president Sorry I said it. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, with the gentleman from Minnesota, yeah, with, with the president making heart flutter such a popular thing, I think we should all get into the act. <laughs> well, I, I want to thank the gentleman. He in fact is one of the members of the committee that is most faithful in attending the hearings and I know he has responsibilities elsewhere. We are looking forward to uh, his two colleagues from uh, Minnesota who uh, are going to be able to uh, help the committee a great deal with their experience. But let us begin this morning. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. Uh, also, I want to commend you for this hearing. Uh, I did not realize until we got the uh, fact sheet that by volume, uh, municipal solid waste generation uh, is, this is roughly 30 percent of that municipal solid waste generation. Uh, I think that 
the focus that this subcommittee is able to bring to this particular issue may bring a more sound approach and certainly will prepare us as we move to markup on this important legislation. I commend you for uh, holding this uh, subcommittee hearing this morning. I thank the gentleman. One of the things I hope we will find out is whether or not the designers of packages realize, one, what a large portion of the problem they are, or whether they understand the extent of the solid waste problem in this country to which they're contributing. With that, I'd like to uh, welcome to the committee our colleague uh, Frank Pallone of New Jersey, who has uh, a record of being very active in this area. I'd like to uh, say that your uh, full prepared statement will be made a part of the record without objection, and you may proceed as you wish. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's a switch there somewhere. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I will try to summarize the uh, written statement. And again, I would say, as all of you have, that uh, I'm very pleased that the subcommittee has chosen to, to uh, focus some attention uh, on this overpackaging issue of consumer products, because I think it really is a very important issue. Fourteen months ago, along with three national environmental groups, uh, U.S. PERG, Clean Water Action, and the Environmental Action Foundation, uh, I established a campaign to spotlight the packaging, uh, uh, waste packaging, and it's called the Wastemaker Awards. It's essentially an award uh, that we give pretty much on a quarterly basis every three months uh, to educate consumers about environmental choices that confront them and to basically urge them to shop environmentally by choosing products uh, that do not overpackage and that are uh, recyclable or that have recyclable packaging. Our group called the Waste Watch Group has singled out 30 consumer products for the dubious distinction of the Wastemaker Award since February of 1990. And I have to tell you that we have no trouble going through supermarkets and various uh, stores and finding uh, candidates for these awards. In fact, it really it comes down to choosing essentially the ones that are the worst, but there are quite a few that we could choose that we don't because we simply don't have the time. We plan to continue giving out the awards until we see some real changes in manufacturers' attitudes towards the solid waste problem evidenced by action to cut packaging waste. And I should tell you, and one of the examples I will give today is that we have had a number of manufacturers actually respond to us and make changes in packaging, and I am going to highlight one of them at the end of my uh, testimony. I should tell you that nowhere is the solid waste problem worse than it is in the Northeast. And if I could give my own state of New Jersey as an example, we are now shipping most of our municipal solid waste out of the state, whereas just a few years ago, New Jersey was a net importer of solid waste for disposal in our own landfills. This means big problems for the environment. It means big problems for taxpayers, because as landfill space dwindles and the amount of waste we generate continues to go up, so do taxes and disposal fees. I know that the chairman has uh, summarized pretty much the problem that we face nationally in terms of the amount of wasteful packaging that goes into landfills uh, and the cost to the consumer and to municipalities. So I'm not going to zero in on that. That's in my written statement. But I would say that manufacturers could make a significant contribution to solving our solid waste dilemma if they would just kick the overpackaging habit. Unfortunately, there are significant financial inducements to continue the packaging binge because to a large manufacturer of consumer products, packaging is not simply the vehicle by which products are brought to the market and sold, but packaging itself means profits. Um, basically, American corporations spend about $68 billion each year on packaging alone. If you break this down, it means that corporations spend $3 million per hour every business day simply wrapping their products. And of course, who pays for all this overpackaging? The American consumer. They're hit twice. In effect, they're forced to pay higher waste disposal costs as taxpayers, and as consumers, they're the ones who cover packaging costs by paying higher prices at the cash register. In order to turn this around, the consumers need to send a message to waste manufacturers manufacturers by refusing to buy their products. Essentially, the Waste Maker Awards is an education process, primarily for the consumer, but also to try to get the manufacturer to change their packaging. Now, I know that some of the members of the committee and other members of Congress have talked about some regulations or legislation that would require environmental responsibility for manufacturers. And I just want to list the ones that I think really should be implemented, if I could. Among those proposals that I think deserves a serious consideration are those that would require all packaging to be composed of at least 35 percent recycled fiber or that it be reusable or recyclable. Then there's the National Bottle Bill, sponsored by our colleague Paul Henry of Michigan, 
which I believe would dramatically cut the flow of containers to landfills and guarantee a steady stream of high quality recyclable material to recycling facilities. Another proposal would establish materials efficiency standards by setting a product to package ratio of 90-10. And you are probably also aware, of course, of the proposals by Congressman Sikorsky and in the Senate by Frank Lautenberg, my colleague from New Jersey, that would establish guidelines for environmental claims so that many manufacturers, you know, manufacturers are now making claims with regard to packaging. And I think that we need to clarify exactly whether those claims are accurate. I just want to conclude today by giving you an example. Um, as I said, we've had about 30 of the Wastemaker Awards. The one I'm going to show you today is one that we are now highlighting that has been changed to basically um, do what I consider environmentally sound. Um, there are three items here. This is the traditional fab detergent with fabric softener. It's manufactured by Colgate Palmolive companies, the one that you know, has been around for years, essentially just the detergent in a cardboard box. Well, a few years ago, they began manufacturing what they call Fab One Shot, which essentially is disposable, um, single-use type detergent. And when it was first manufactured, uh, it came in a very large cardboard box like this. And inside was a hard plastic tray. And then each of these things was individually placed, or a few of them placed, in the tray as such, and then again coated with the plastic. And of course, then it was placed inside here, and this is how it was displayed. Now, you can easily see the problem here, not only the so much larger box, okay, but also the packaging in the tray, as well as the packaging around that. Now, what we did is that we highlighted this as one of our Wastemaker Awards. And interestingly, and, and to their credit, because many of the Wastemakers maybe eventually will come around to changing things, but in this case, Colgate Palmolive responded the very day of our award and said, you know, you're right. Um, it's not necessary that we do this. There is a lot of wasteful use of plastic in this, and we are going to design something um, that basically responds to your concerns. So on February 1st of 1991, we received a letter. I received a letter from the president of Colgate Palmolive, and I will enter that in the record if, uh, if I could, Mr. Objection. Chairman, essentially saying that they uh, were ready to put out the new product and that it... Uh, would eliminate the plastic. So as you can see now, the new Fab One Shot, which is on the market, um, actually has twice as much detergent. In other words, instead of 16 packets, it now has 32 in a essentially using less cardboard and at the same time simply putting the little packets inside the box without any plastic. Very simple. Um, they've obviously found that they can promote this just as effectively, and I just wanted to use that as an example, essentially, of some of the things that really can be done if manufacturers put their mind to it. We have other examples of it, but I didn't want to give those all to the committee today. But I just wanted to point out that even without legislation, uh, obviously, if we can educate the public and if we can get manufacturers to respond, this will make a difference. And we will be continuing our wa Wastemaker Awards uh, as long as we consider, uh, see significant progress, which we continue to towards lessening this overpackaging problem. Thank you again for uh, listening to me, and I think it's uh, it's uh, commendable that the committee is uh, taking this up in the context of the RICRA reauthorization. Frank, I'm very very pleased that you uh, made the presentation to the committee, particularly uh, ending on a positive note, because I think uh, sometimes uh, we give the impression as we examine problems, as we must around here give the impression that nobody is doing anything about them, and that's not always the case. Maybe you will need a former Wastemaker Award that uh, you could give as well at some point. Gentleman from Pennsylvania. I want to uh, echo the comments of my chairman and also just point out, you, you mentioned that, uh, that there was all this profit in packaging, and that was, it's part of the, obviously, part of the marketing game. But what looks interesting to me there as I see the two fab packages, the, sec the latest package looks to be a cheaper package. And I'm not sure what the price was on the final product, but it may be that there is profit in the efficient packaging. And if you can combine uh, creativity uh, with efficiency, you might actually make profit from reducing package volume. Uh, that, that's my impression from what you have shown. 
It's possible. I, you know, I, I really didn't uh, come today with the uh, figures in terms of the cost because, again, the volumes in each of these are different, so we'd have to kind of figure it out by unit or well, something. Well, you don't have like a that. plastic tray. No, this it, is uh, completely without plastic. You see, and the pla so if you eliminate the plastic tray, you eliminate the cost of the plastic tray. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out. And then, so all they're doing is, and, and the volume of the box looks somewhat similar, uh, and uh, plus it's containing more. Exactly. So uh, probably, the, and if the pr and if the price per pack it hasn't changed, they may have actually made more more money by 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 showing efficiency. It's very possible. I thank uh, Chairman for you. Gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Frank, did you uh, calculate uh, what type of volume savings just on one, on this one product? I haven't um, done that. I mean, basically, what I just wanted to point out is the obvious thing, which is that they've eliminated the plastic. I mean, not only is there no plastic, which of course would contribute to the landfill, but of course I we feel very strongly that that plastic is undesirable and much more mm. difficult to recycle. In a lot of places, there isn't even a mechanism to recycle plastics. And so the fact that this is not only cardboard, but also 100% uh, recyclable uh, is what we've been focusing on more so than you know, the, the, the actual volume. But clearly, the, um, you know, by eliminating the plastic, you have a lot less material going into the landfill. Right. Well, obviously, this is a good corporate citizen. The uh, people responded when you brought this to their attention. Have you had any other responses? Oh, absolutely. We've had, uh, I guess, of the 30 awards that uh, we've uh, given out, we've had three that positively responded and said they were redesigning their packaging. Um, in fact, the next waste, waste maker awards, as the chairman uh, uh, hinted, will be a positive one, just highlighting those who, who have made the changes. Uh, I just I just want to point out in fact, the gentleman from Texas would yield. yield. Uh, we got to be careful what's bad and what's good. Uh, plastic isn't necessarily bad. If if there is a, a market for recyclable materials, it can add to that market and draw in other plastic products that are quite necessary oh. within the economic mainstream. And sometimes you know we had this thing about fo foam cups versus paper. And we had this, I guess McDonald's got, it was McDonald's that was involved in that. But if you look at where the pollution comes and the ener energy usage and all, if you look at these things in full cycle, and I think we have to do that before we would act here, uh, you found that these, uh, these foam cups actually polluted less, or you could make a very good case that they actually polluted less than the paper cups. So mm -hmm. I yield back to the gentleman from Texas. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you. Thank you. Frank, thank you very much for your help to the committee. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Our second panel includes Mr. Jason Berman, who is president of the Recording Industry Association of America, Ms. Miriam Granberg, who is executive vice president of the uh, National Association of Recording Merchandisers Scholarship Foundation, and Mr. Scott Soderud, who is the marketing manager for consumer electronics of the Dow Chemical Company, and he is representing the Jewel Box advocates and manufacturers. We welcome all three of you to the committee. Uh, without objection, uh, your and all other witnesses' complete prepared statements will be made a part of the uh, hearing record. And you may proceed uh, to summarize your statements in any manner you choose. We'll recognize first Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Jay Berman. I'm president of the Recording Industry I think Association. there may be a switch there that you could there okay. you go. My name is Jay Berman. I'm president of the Recording Industry Association of America. The RIAA is the trade association representing the interests of record companies that create, manufacture, and distribute over 95% of the recorded music sold in the United States. RIA members also produce over 50% of the pre-recorded music sold worldwide. We thank you for the opportunity to testify today on an issue of vital importance to record companies, their artists, environmentalists, retailers, and our consumers. I'm especially honored to appear before this committee, Mr. Chairman, as I know of your keen appreciation of music and your commitment both to sound packaging and to sound recordings. Our membership consists of, of both the major companies, such as Warner Brothers, RCA, and Capital, as well as many smaller companies like Solar and Jamie Records. 
Each is equally committed to finding an alternative to the current method of packaging for compact discs. I have the good fortune of representing an industry that has historically been concerned about and active in behalf of a cleaner environment. Major recording artists such as Sting, Roseanne Cash, Bruce Springsteen, and others have used their talents to not only raise money for important environmental causes, but to raise America's environmental consciousness as well. Many record companies and their artists carry environmental messages on the packaging of their works. This interest in environmental responsibility is just as evident in the matter of CD packaging. Compact discs did not emerge on the market until 1983. From the outset, they were packaged in either a plastic or cardboard disposable long box, the current method of packaging, so as to provide for ready display in record stores. Retailers were able to convert one LP record bin to two that would hold CD long boxes. As their popularity grew, CDs began to displace the sale of vinyl albums and singles. In 1990, CD sales totaled roughly $3.5 billion, which represented one-third of all unit sales, while album sales generated just about a quarter of as much revenue. But, and rightly so, the high visibility of the compact disc also brought into focus the packaging format used to market the product. Environmental groups, consumers, our companies and their artists voice concerns about the waste created by the disposable long box. In response, RIA member companies, representatives of packaging manufacturers, and retailers met in September of 1990 to discuss alternative forms of packaging for the CD. In January of this year, a consensus was reached among the six major distribution companies that, this, that the disposable long box for the CD was in fact dead. The challenge before us now is to find acceptable alternatives. Alternative packaging must satisfy several important goals. First, it must have minimal disposable parts. Second, it must have high perceived consumer value. A new package must continue to instill consumer confidence that the CD has been protected in its journey from the manufacturer to the retail store. Any alternative package must provide for safekeeping of the CD long after its purchase. And finally, it must minimize the expense and the security risk to the retailer. With these goals in mind, we have studied and debated a variety of formats. It should be emphasized that for antitrust reasons, any industry announcement will be limited to setting voluntary standards for new dimensions of CD packaging and not to set upon one particular package. Indeed, as with the current voluntary CD long box dimension standard, the choice of packaging materials and design that conform to the dimensions will be left to each individual company to determine. With this important caveat, Mr. Chairman, that it requisite be that it is environmentally friendly. There are, in fact, several alternatives now being considered. First, we have been looking to the move to a jewel box size format, which would allow companies to merely shrink wrap their existing five by five and a half box. As you know, the jewel box is the plastic container used by companies to house the CD itself. However, these restrictive dimensions pose serious problems for the retailer. While I'm sure my co-panelists will lay out these concerns in more detail, retailers are understandably worried about the theft of the smaller package, the expense of refixturing, refixturing their stores to accommodate the smaller jewel box, and marketing concerns due to the reduced space for graphics and information. In this regard, I want to note that we have explored the possibility of store security systems, including some type of mechanism that could be placed on the CD package itself during the manufacturing process. While this exploration continues, it has been complicated by the fact that retail stores, which range from standalone to mall locations, are each configured so differently that a single uniform security system in the manufacturing process appears to be unworkable at the moment. 
The recording industry is committed to finding environmentally responsible alternative packaging. Several prototypes that have been developed include the DigiPack. This is a uh, current version of the uh, new Grateful Dead album in the uh, DigiPack format. The DigiPack is a mostly cardboard folding pack which is supported by plastic tracks. And you have to remove the tracks. Will the gentleman yield? Just for one moment, are, are these samples going to be provided to the members of the committee? Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Ritter, we'd be happy to provide the packaging exclusive of the sound recording inside. <laughs> I might add that, that the price of most CDs this uh, day would go over that permissible under the ethics of the uh, uh, Congress. I, I don't believe that's true any uh, longer, Mr. Chairman. I happen to know it is definitely not true. <laughs> What's on that new Grateful Dead album, anyway? <laughs> We're showing our age. Uh, the DigiPack, which is a mostly cardboard folding pack supported by plastic tracks, and the cardboard and plastic Echo Pack that contains a sliding tray mechanism that allows the package to fold to a jewel box size once opened. This, in effect, is the Echo Pack, which is currently being explored uh, and has actually been endorsed by the uh, WIA family of labels uh, in a recent announcement indicating uh, that they were prepared to go forward uh, and actually release uh, sometime in 1992 CD packaging in the Echo Pack. Uh, and in fact, they, they're actually talking now about um, doing that in uh, late 1991. These packages address both environmental and retailer concerns as the CD can be sold in an approximately 5 by 11 format, obviating the need for refixturing, while containing in one case no disposable parts except the shrink wrap covering the packaging, and in the other only small plastic strips. In addition, there are two recently announced alternative jewel box which are being considered that, like the Echo Pack, contain no disposable parts but, be, but could be opened to an approximately 5 by 11 size and sold in existing bins. Now, Mr. Chairman, this is the current long box package, uh, which we have announced is in fact dead going forward. But I do want to point out that uh, currently uh, a number of artists uh, are using the current long box uh, for, for what I believe I regard and I believe you would regard uh, to be uh, uh, worthwhile public message. Here's a Lenny Kravitz, which on the back uh, deals with the question of supporting the motor voter bill. Um, REM in its most recent... I happen to be the author of that legislation. Uh, I was a, aware of that. I, and, and you're very good in the selection of the materials you're bringing before the committee. Uh, uh, REM's most recent uh, uh, CD package in the long box contains the same message, Mr. Chairman. We're doing everything we can to support the bill. <laughs> In March, RIA issued a press release stating that record companies were committed to an alternative to the disposable long box package. We indicated that by early June, we hoped for an announcement on a voluntary standard for new package dimensions. As you can see from the prototypes, we are in fact serious about this commitment. Any new package must meet all of the concerns that have been raised. For once a company chooses the alternative package, it is estimated to cost between two and three million dollars to retool a single manufacturing facility. Storage and boxing facilities must also be reconfigured and merchandising changes may well be needed. Although our companies have made the irrevocable decision to change the CD package, it will not happen overnight. I hope to be able to report back to this committee in the coming weeks with an end date for the switchover. We estimate that it will be approximately one year from announcement date, possibly earlier, before significant changes are visible to the consumer. We appreciate this, cons this committee's interest. Congressional support for our efforts is in fact important. I can assure you that RIAA member companies are moving as rapidly as possible to replace the disposable long box 
with more environmentally sound packaging. We are committed to this end. We will succeed. We are, in fact, aiming for the carrot of consumer and public approval, not the stick of government regulation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Berman, thank you very much. Uh, recognize uh, Ms. Granberg. I don't have a light. I did. Ah, there we go. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Miriam Granberg. I am a former executive vice president of the National Association of Recording Merchandisers, now a consultant to that organization. NARM is the National Trade Association whose members operate 15,000 retail locations where sound recordings are sold. These record stores are in downtown areas of major cities, in suburban shopping malls, and in small towns across America. They bring every musical genre, popular, classical, jazz, country, Grateful Dead, you name it, as well as recorded literature to the American people. We appreciate very much your invitation to participate in this discussion, and particularly the subcommittee's recognition that in pursuing their goal, Congress must also note the burdens that particular measures may impose on both consumers and the retailers who serve them. Before addressing packaging, uh, I'd like to just mention NARM's support of the motor voter legislation. <laughs> we are very involved, and I, as a consultant, have been assigned to the task to administer the Rock the Vote effort on the part of retailers throughout the United States. I will try not to be redundant and echo Mr. Berman's comments. Obviously, some of my remarks will be very similar to his. I think it's important that you know that the retail community indeed endorses much of what Mr. Berman has discussed from the manufacturing community's point of view. Nearly 10 years ago, when the compact disc was first introduced, the industry, seriously frustrated by the emergence of a cassette package, which they really deemed unsatisfactory, both for merchandising purposes and in the theft aspect, determined that we would not make the same mistake with the introduction of the compact disc. Thank you. The industry, in a very short time, reached a consensus that a 6x12 package would be ideal. It would allow retailers to continue using 12x12 12 12 inch fixtures, which were developed for LPs. The same graphics could be used, merely modified. It would allow consumers to find the product. It would also make it difficult for the consumers to steal the product. Once it had been purchased, the outer package could simply be thrown away. And of course, this occurred at a time when not very many Americans were thinking about the environment or the impact an innocuous thing like a package might make on it. Obviously, times have changed. As Mr. Berman stated, musicians were among the first to sound the alarm on this issue. And we were not surprised as record retailers have grown accustomed to our artists being active in a variety of worthy causes. Civil Liberties, Farm Aid, Hands Across America, and just last weekend, Kurdish Relief. For over a year, the industry engaged in active dialogue. There is no question that the 6x12 package is no longer an alternative. But why all the fuss? Why not simply display the jewel box in existing fixtures? mainly because no store in the United States has fixtures that were designed to hold it. In addition, any retailer can tell you that putting CDs out in just a jewel box is inviting theft in a segment of retailing which already suffers from far higher than average pilferage. So what are the alternatives? Retailers could decide to build all new fixtures. This is a very costly solution that could run into tens, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars. And of course, as the gentleman discussed earlier, the cost would then be passed on to the consumer. 
or the retailer could replace the long box with what we call a plastic keeper that lets the jewel box fit into the old fixture. This too costs money <clears throat> to purchase, labor to put on and take off. If the CDs are being sold in a mass merchant environment like Kmart or Walmart, there is no one on the floor to take the plastic keeper off. That goes back to the customer throwing away the box, and this is plastic and a bigger problem. Moreover, whatever approach is taken to the display fixture problem, packaging CDs in a five inch by five and a half inch jewel box alone leaves retailers terribly vulnerable to theft. This, in addition to the concern that this small jewel box will not accommodate the graphics and the explanatory information that our consumer needs before he buys the product is a major concern. Last fall and winter, the industry held numerous meetings. You've heard some description of those meetings. Prototypes for various packages were developed, tests implemented, and the results were shared. The environmental impact of every package was evaluated by the National Recycling Coalition. This past March, one of the industry's largest suppliers, WIA, announced its commitment to a new CD package, which Mr. Berman brought with him, a paper cardboard package, which they believe not only meets our criteria, but surpasses them. The reduction in discarded material in this package is nearly 100 percent. The only thing that gets discarded is the shrink wrap. The rest of the package gets folded up so that what you really have in your hand is something like your 12 by 12 inch LP looked like, but this time accommodating a compact disc. Of course, Yankee ingenuity in the capitalist system being what it is, at least two other packages, which appear to be equally well designed, have surfaced. Each of the new packages is the 5 inch by 11 inch size, collapsible to the size of a jewel box. At least one of these new packages, we are told, when collapsed, is indeed only and exactly a jewel box. In other words, the package in the store will look like this, shrink wrap on top of it. When the consumer throws the shrink wrap away, you have your jewel box so that there's nothing else that gets discarded. It gives the retailer the opportunity to display it, and it will deter theft. NARM knows that the days of the long box are at an end. We are proud to have played a substantial role in promoting the industry effort to eliminate wasteful packaging. Immodestly, we feel that the music industry should be commended for its commitment to a packaging solution that will benefit the artists, the retailers, the record manufacturers, the consumers, and the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Recognize now Mr. Uh, Scott Sutterud. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to comment on the waste-related issues surrounding compact disc packaging. My name is Scott Sanderud, Market Manager for Consumer Electronics at Dow Plastics and Chairman of JAM. I am speaking on behalf of JAM, which stands for Jewel Box Advocates and Manufacturers. This industry organization is comprised of jewel box manufacturers, plastic resin manufacturers, record label companies, and others concerned with maintaining the jewel box as the pre preferred storage container for CDs worldwide. The issue of what constitutes the most environmentally suitable CD merchandising package and storage container has emerged as a major issue in recent years. The debate on CD packaging also has come to symbolize for many the issue of, quote, excess packaging as our country has become aware of garbage disposal issues. In the U.S., the predominant design is a paperboard box, which you have seen, or long box, that houses a plastic container. Consumer purchases it like this. The same thing is repeated on the jewel box that's on the outside package, and you discard the long box. The long box serves no useful purpose once the CD is purchased, so it is immediately discarded. 
The jewel box is maintained by the consumer because it offers long-term protection and convenient storage for the CD. <coughs> the continuing debate surrounding CD packaging has led to the current industry consensus that the long box is no longer acceptable. JAM agrees with this conclusion. JAM offers the jewel box only option for the industry, consumers, and the environment. The jewel box only is the standard in every other country in the world. I would like to emphasize that JAM does not believe that government action is necessary to address concerns raised about packaging. The environment is just one of a number of considerations when designing on an appropriate package. In addition to being environmentally acceptable, there are other issues that are important considerations for any alternative package. For example, the container must continue to meet the functional needs for CD protection, such as durability and ease of use. The container must be low cost for the record manufacturers and, of course, acceptable to the consumer. The jewel box only alternative meets all of these requirements. A shrink wrap jewel box offers the best waste management solution for CD merchandising. First, this option is consistent in all aspects with the Environmental Protection Agency's hierarchy for waste management. The top two options of source reduction and recycling are addressed as follows. Source reduction. In the jewel box only alternative, the long box is eliminated. The consumer only discards the shrink wrap around the jewel box. The jewel box has dual functionality as both the merchandising package and as the permanent storage container for the CD. Thus, a very significant source reduction is achieved. If I may demonstrate shrink wrap jewel box, the consumer would take it home, tear off the shrink wrap, they keep this entire storage container, and this is all that's thrown away. Recycling. In the unlikely event that the consumer chooses to dispose of the jewel box, it would be possible to recycle the container. The technology to recycle polystyrene is commercially available today. Also, the 10 to 20 percent of the more than 300 million CD packages sold each year that are returned to the record companies can be reused or recycled instead of ending up in landfills, providing they are sold in a jewel box. Most important, the jewel box only alternative represents minimum risk to the industry because it has long been proven that the consumer prefers the jewel box as the permanent CD storage container. Our research in CD Review magazine showed that the jewel box was preferred by consumers six to one over a paperboard alternative. The jewel box only solution also offers the following benefits. Quick implementation. Most record label companies already have equipment to shrink wrap jewel boxes because that is how record clubs sell them. It's low cost. Adequate supply exists for jewel boxes and no new capital is needed in the industry. The total cost per unit is the lowest of any alternative. Cost savings without the long box. The price of the long box as well as shipping, inventory, and warehousing costs are saved. There are some issues at the retailer level that must be addressed to adopt this alternative. However, we feel that the industry can work with the retailers to make this alternative acceptable. In conclusion, the elimination of the long box is a warranted measure in addressing the need to reduce waste from CD packaging. JAM supports this industry consensus, and we recommend a shrink-wrap, jewel box only alternative. In choosing this option, waste will be reduced at the source, the transition can be made quickly, and costs are minimal. This alternative best serves everyone's interest in reducing waste, minimizing any unnecessary financial hardship on the industry, and in protecting our environment. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, let me say that I'm enormously pleased to hear that yeah. the industry is aware of the problem, is working on it. Uh, that's very encouraging. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I do have a couple of questions that I think grow out of an observation. It's awfully hard to change. I don't like to change. Don doesn't like to change. It's not human to be eager to change. And I, and I don't wish to be particularly critical, but one of, one of the dismaying things I have when I go on a college campus is there isn't anybody anymore who remembers who Rube Goldberg was. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, I don't. Ah, J Jason, I'm, I appreciate that. Then you know what I'm... You're, you're he left this behind when he died. Mechanism. He left this behind when he died. <laughs> right? I mean, this is an example of how somebody just simply doesn't want to give up on a bad idea 
And so they've gone to this incredible length of sliding boxes. You have the instructions here so somebody can figure out how to do this. And the fact is, you know, I was in London, and I was in Tower Records uh, in London, and I was, and I can't remember the name of it, but a, a major domestic Tower Record type of a facility in London. HMV. They don't have, yeah, they don't have any of this stuff. They sell them in the jewel boxes. Uh, question, what, uh, between LPs and, and cassettes and CDs, what's the share of the market anymore? Uh, in, in unit sales, currently, uh, CDs represent uh, somewhere about 35% of unit sales. Uh, cassettes represent uh, about 55 to 57% of unit sales, and the rest is represented by LPs. It's an increasingly declining percentage. In okay, the, so uh, this is in the United States. LPs in the United States are 10% of the market. Uh, actually, somewhat less, Mr. Chairman. And going down. And going down. Okay. What is the typical form in which cassettes are sold in retail stores in this country? Cassettes now in retail stores are generally just in the jewel box. And as you will notice in my statement, the retail community is unhappy in terms of merchandising that cassette. What happened is when cassettes became a major force in the market, there was still the 12-inch LP in the stores, which was used as a merchandising vehicle, so that the necessity to merchandise the product on the actual product itself, uh, the necessity being that way with the CD, because there's no more LP. Uh, the merchandising aspect is kind of interesting, too, uh, it was interesting to hear that record manufacturers can very easily shrink wrap the jewel box because they are already doing it for the record clubs. Uh, unfortunately, the record clubs are not really selling CDs. They're giving away eight CDs for a penny. Retailers have to sell that product and therefore are in a position of having to promote it and that compounds the problem. The cassette solution was not a satisfactory one. It lived uh, in a record store because the 12-inch LP had the ability to merchandise the product, and as Jay said, that obviously is going down every day. Uh, well, I, I think if I could comment on, on your uh, uh, experience in the UK, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's very likely that in a store uh, either the size of Tower in London or HMV or uh, Virgin Record Store in London, that those stores uh, have very sophisticated security systems in, in store mm -hmm. where, the, where the CD itself uh, mm -hmm. is a jewel box only. I'm sure that's sale. true. Yeah. Well, well what I'm kind of getting at is that it seems to me that before I became an old fogey, I usually went into a record store to buy something because I'd heard it on a radio, I'd heard it somewhere else, the other kids talked about it, something like that. The idea that somehow Kemp Mill Records is, is going to have to close its doors because it can't display its cassettes kind of belies the fact that LPs are already down to less than 10% of the total market and the cassettes are 55% of the market. People are buying cassettes even though Display. Got, it really got caused kind of or up having done the way we've always done. So there was merchandise capability kind of way. Uh, were down, but people had that on the product promote and the reference video is interesting I think what retail finding about the country is that because of the package formats in radio uh, there's less product that's being exposed and less product that the consumer learns about <coughs> via radio and a great deal of the exposure to new product is happening actually in the record store the other thing that occurs to me is that 
One of the major arguments that I'm hearing is that because everybody's bins were designed for LPs, we've got to do that. Now, the LP is dead. It's gone. Bye. It's less than 10 percent now on its way down, and I don't know if you wanted to buy an LP two years from now, whether you could find one for any new album. But is what I'm being told is because the LP, now dead and gone, set a standard for a bin, we have to deal with this kind of Rube Goldberg way to approach a packaging and a merchandising problem, rather than figuring the LP is gone and the bins eventually have got to go, and why don't, why doesn't the industry and the retail community simply recognize that and get on with a more rational way of doing it, rather than trying to adapt cassettes and CDs to an LP format when the LP is gone. Does that really make, is that really a sensible way? Isn't that just kind of being drag kicking and screaming into a new reality? Well, I think unfortunately the quote Rube Goldberg contraption that you're looking at yeah. uh, doesn't really convey what could happen in the event that one of the packages which are in development uh, satisfies the fact that it ends up in a jewel box or something like a jewel box and the only thing that's discarded is the shrink wrap and you have the ability to do that and merchandise the product too which doesn't hurt the environment which takes nothing away from that aspect of it and yet deals with the problem of theft and deals with the problem of marketing. Uh, I don't see any downside if in fact that can be accomplished and it seems as if, as, as if it's well on its way. Yes, the retooling will take a little bit of time, but we're talking about a problem which we will be dealing with for decades and for centuries. And if that problem can be solved, I think it is something to pursue. Mr. Chairman, if I may address yes, the certainly. question also. Um, the, there was a time when a new, the CD was new to the marketplace. And any time a new electronic technology is introduced, there's always the question of how well the consumer will accept that. Back in 1983, it made sense to have a long box type of package to fit the bins. But we agree that today, we know what format one, and that's the CD and the cassette. If you go into almost any mall record store these days, they are either CD only or CD and cassette. And I think it proves what, uh, what has happened in the industry. I'd also like to offer that uh, the retailers have some concerns about how to pay for this retooling to get rid of these old racks. And there was an excellent article written by children's recording artist Rafi uh, in Billboard magazine that details such a plan. As you know, there is a cost to industry to supply this uh, long box, and that cost will be saved by going to a jewel box only format. In doing so, I'm sure that something could be worked out between the record companies as well as the retailers to help subsidize the cost of new displays in the stores. I wonder in that regard, Mr. Certainly. Chairman, if, if Mr. Dow is prepared to join the, in the subsidization process. It's always good to give away someone else's money. We do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think then there, we're here asking for some. I think there were several methods discussed of possibly doing that. And it would be so burdensome that in actual uh, fact, it could not be accomplished with anybody saving anything. The administrative costs of figuring out an equitable way of doing that relative to large chains, to independent retailers, do you base it on past purchases, do you base it on future purchases, would be so burdensome that any kind of anticipated financial saving probably would not be accomplished. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just saying to, to say that, that record stores have to be configured forever the way they were configured for LPs is kind of ridiculous. I mean, they, when the 78 disappeared and the LP came in, they had to do some things. I remember all the old 10-inch bins. They couldn't, and then we had some 10-inch LPs for a very short time. 
And then you had, to, you had to change it because the industry changed and we had 12 inch LPs and they were standard for decades and now they're not anymore. And, and trying to stretch the packaging on cassettes and CDs in order to fit bins that were designed for a 1950s, 60s, 70s technology, uh, it just seems to me ridiculous, Mr. Berman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think we'll get, if we get hung up in, this, in the uh, question of the Rube Goldberg uh, uh, stops along the road to the final uh, product, I, I think we'll do ourselves a disservice. And whether the final product is enlarged or shrunk is, is almost irrelevant in the sense that if it's environmentally friendly, and in the end, all you end up disposing of is the shrink wrap, I think that's the goal we want to get to, and quite frankly, it's the only goal within uh, the antitrust laws that the Recording Industry Association of America is permitted uh, to deal with in terms of its member companies. Uh, so that I, I think what we need to focus on is one, the fact that the long box is dead and that there are, in fact, uh, efforts underway to move to an acceptable alternative. Well, let me not, not belabor this, and I want to recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania. The old line about it's not what you don't know, it's what you know that ain't so that hurts you. Seems to me that, that you got a lot of retailers who I think have high anxiety levels about a bunch of stuff and are trying to do it the old familiar way when probably more creative thinking about adapting to the new circumstances would make more sense. If y'all can come up with, with, with some way of doing it that reduces the packaging, uh, I guess as a public policy maker, I don't care whether you do the jewel box and shrink wrap it, which, which what seems to me the preeminently sensible thing to do, or you do something else as a policy maker, I guess I can't care. I'll tell you, as a consumer, I hate that box. But it's not my business as a policy maker to say you can't do it. If you meet my, my environmental concerns and my packaging and waste concerns, and you choose to offend your consumers, that's your business, uh, not mine as a public policy maker. Uh, I, I can assure you that it's uh, neither in the interest of the record companies to uh, offend its consumers, be they retailers or the ultimate consumer in this regard. Well, I, I thank you. Clearly, the industry is aware. Clearly, you're searching for some solutions. Clearly, there are some economic things at stake. I happen to agree coincidentally with something that happens to be best for the business of Mr. Uh, Soderud, and that is also not my role as a public policy maker to, to pick and choose who the winners are in that sense. Uh, so keep at it. Uh, as, we, as we go on with our RICRA legislation, we would like to work with you. Uh, we would like to see that the legislation will encourage you and all other packagers to do the right thing, not get in your way uh, for any innovative things that you'd like to do. Uh, I appreciate your being here uh, and, and letting me uh, uh, interact with you in this regard. Recognize the gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I would agree with you uh, on a couple of points. Uh, we're not that well equipped to, design, to de define the future of the jewel box, the long box. I almost feel like saying, you know, the long box is dead, long live the jewel box. <laughs> you know, or alas, poor long box, we knew him well. <laughs> uh, it just shows you, I mean, all these names and terms, first time I ever heard of it, frankly. I mean, I buy CDs, but I never knew what it was called. And uh, it, each, it seems each industry can have its own uh, uniqueness where the experts will gather and argue uh, long into the night. We know how to you do certain jobs and packaging I don't think is one of them. We know how to give out money as the chairman said and, and the size of the federal deficit shows that uh, we've been very successful at it. Anyhow, um, I'd like to just uh, get a, a response from the three panelists as to whether they think that uh, the American industry is uh, is going to respond to this uh, consumer uh, public demand to reduce the amounts and volumes of packaging uh, or when it, are we going to need uh, setting some kind of government guidelines, standards, 
by a regulation to do this job. Yes. Uh, uh, well, I can only respond, uh, Mr. Ritter, on behalf of uh, the recording companies. And I think in this regard, uh, we've had this uh, process underway for some time. We're committed to it. Uh, I, I don't think it, it requires uh, the specifics of uh, a statute to get it done. Um, and uh, I, I think we're going to have uh, an answer uh, in short order. So I would say that the role that uh, this committee plays in overseeing that process, and as long as the committee is satisfied that there are benchmarks along the way, uh, the road uh, is a somewhat bumpy one, but it, it will produce a result, and I think it's to be preferred over some uh, statutory requirement. We, we've, got the we've, we've received the message, both from our uh, consumers and from the government in terms of its concerns, and we're responding to it. Now, now let's talk about Motor Voter. <laughs> <laughs> Do you honestly believe that the LA Motor Vehicle Bureau is going to safeguard the sanctity of voter registrations? No, I'm sorry. Sounds good to me. Uh, where are you from, LA? <laughs> This well, is then, then, lot, then, then, the, <laughs> then the then the new yeah right right she knows where she's at and she knows exactly who the chairman is. <laughs> well, anyway, if, if, if the L.A. Motor Vehicle Bureau is anything like the New York City Motor Vehicle Bureau, uh, the sanctity of the voting <laughs> process in America may not be protected. Anyway, <laughs> the gentleman from Dow. Yes, to answer your question, both Dow and Jam. Uh, we want to protect the environment from poor packaging practices, but uh, we feel that industry needs the ability to do this based on sound business principles. Uh, the environmental question is just one of a series of issues that must be addressed for an appropriate package. Uh, and we feel that industry is beginning to really step up and address those issues in a very responsible way without the help of, of governmental reg regulation. I'm confident that the music industry is going to respond. It is a directive not only relative to uh, what our consumers want, but the retailers are very concerned about our artists' objectives and their goals because, in effect, the music is our inventory, not the physical package. And this is the direction in which the artists are going. They've made it very clear, and it would be very, very bad business not to go along with what their goals are. And I, I assume that the counterpart to the artists in, in your industry are the housewives who use fab uh, <laughs> in, in uh, some other industry. Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. Yield back and balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Uh, recognize the gentleman from Ohio who has no questions. Uh, could, could you supply just in, in written form for the record and each of you who would like to, I'd be interested in what the the end cost is between in, to, to, to put the package out of the eco pack versus the long box with a jewel box versus jewel box alone. And I don't know whether you have those at your fingertips. I just like to have it. We'll, we'll try to get them. Remembering, Mr. Chairman, the eco pack is just something that, that one company has determined it's uh, worth in exploring. Well, or any other comparisons or, you would like to. Fine. To, to make in ways of estimates. Just give us some idea on, on okay. that. Uh, thank you. This is obviously an, an area of personal concern, and I do want to separate my, myself as an individual citizen and myself as a policymaker. Want to, as a policymaker, I want to work with you very much to be sure that what we do does not intrude on your efforts to try and deal with this uh, at, uh, at, within the manufacturing and marketing process of your industry. Thank, thank you, you all very much. Thank you. We uh, are being visited by uh, the Queen of England today, and I think what we are going to try to do is at least complete panel three before we have to break for that, and our apologies to panel four. But uh, we're only colonies, and we must defer to the Queen. Our third panel is Mr. Steve Kramer, who is a city council member in Minneapolis. 
Mr. Curtis Johnson, Executive Director of the Citizens League, representing the Governor's Select Commission on Packaging and Environment in Minnesota, and Mr. Sus and Mrs. Susan Birmingham, environmental lobbyist with U.S. PERG. We welcome all of you. Your statements will be made a part of the record. You may proceed as you uh, wish, and we would begin with uh, Mr. Steve Kramer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I am Steve Kramer, a mm. council member from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'm chairman of the National League of Cities Solid Waste sub Subcommittee of our Energy, Environment, and Natural Resources Committee. I'm here today to testify uh, not only on behalf of the National League of Cities in our 16,000 cities and towns across the country, but also on behalf of the National Association of Counties and the Solid Waste Association of North America, both of whom are partners in our lo local government coalition on solid waste. Mr. Chairman, I would also like to commend you for the process you have initiated in developing legislation to amend RICRA on behalf of local officials. I wish to express our appreciation for your interest in our views uh, mm -hmm. and our recommendations, and we look forward to working with you and your committee in the development of workable, cost-effective legislation on municipal solid waste. Uh, my testimony this morning, uh, in my testimony, I will tell you about an initiative I sponsored in Minneapolis which addressed the problem of product packaging. I will identify key lessons stemming from experience with our ordinance and then conclude by suggesting some federal initiatives that would be effective in dealing with this segment of the solid waste stream and achieving overall waste reduction. By way of background, I'd like to tell you that in Minneapolis, we're experiencing a dramatic increase in the tonnage of recyclables collected uh, at the curb and an associated drop in the amount of uh, mixed municipal solid waste left for disposal. This is a positive trend, but what is equally apparent is that the total amount of material that must be handled in some way, either through recycling or disposal, is not declining. Overall reduction of discards remains a goal to be achieved. And appropriate to your topic today, nowhere is the need for an effective source reduction strategy more compelling than in the area of, of packaging. Two years ago, Minneapolis adopted an ordinance which required food and beverage packaging sold in grocery stores and restaurants to be either recyclable, meaning picked up as part of the city's curbside collection program, returnable or degradable. At the time the ordinance was adopted, Minneapolis collected no plastic material for recycling because of weak reuse markets. Uh, this meant that consumers frequently faced the prospect of buying products which at one time were sold in packaging which could be recycled but which suddenly were sold in a container which could only be thrown away. And this ran counter to the growing environmental ethic in our community and reflects the growing trend towards the use of, of plastic packaging. Uh, now, in addressing that problem, we had multiple goals, uh, and we've achieved those goals in varying degrees. Our first goal was to move more material from non-recyclable to recyclable status. Here we've had great success. The ordinance created a clear incentive for those private sector actors who wanted to continue using and selling plastic packaging to work with the city to establish a viable recycling program for plastics, the one packaging material we were not collecting. And we now have in place, Mr. Chairman, what is acknowledged to, acknowledged to be the nation's most comprehensive curbside plastic recycling program. I would point out to you that the key to our plastic recycling effort was market development and long-term reuse agreement. And if I could diverge just for a moment, Mr. Chairman, RICRA must address the market question, not only for plastics but for recyclables. Uh, in Minneapolis, we could have recycled the plastic container in the fab box, but we could not have recycled the fab box because our local market conditions are such that the paperboard is not recyclable, the plastic is. And so that reflects the, uh, the importance of the market issue in terms of what can and can't be recycled as a practical matter. Our second goal was to reduce the toxicity of the waste stream left for disposal. Here we have had some success. In the course of debating the merits of our ordinance, several major food product companies thoroughly re-examined the constituent elements of their packaging materials. At least one of these companies was candid enough to tell me that they found unnecessary heavy metal content, which they promptly eliminated. Because no recycling program will, div will divert 100% of materials collected, it's important that lead, cadmium, and mercury be eliminated, eliminated from packaging altogether. Our third goal was to limit the amount of excess packaging in the waste stream. And here we have had very little success from the local level for reasons I'll discuss later in my marks. Based on our experience, I'd like to highlight three lessons regarding packaging which I hope are relevant for your deliberations on possible measures aimed at this component of the waste stream. First and foremost, pa overall packaging control, to be most effective, must emanate from the highest level of government. 
local and state officials can be expected to continue to find innovative ways to cope with mounting solid waste, but without decisive federal leadership, especially in the area of packaging, our success will be limited. Uh, secondly, as you said in your opening remarks, Mr. Chairman, uh, packaging engineers and designers can do what they are asked to do. The question is, what goal is on their agenda? Waste reduction is placed on the agenda for food, pro food product companies and their suppliers if Congress makes a demand. Uh, just as food preservation, food safety, and marketing considerations have exerted influence over packaging design, solid waste concerns can as well if Congress acts. Finally, government standards, regulations, and goals will induce private sector action. Uh, my advice to Congress, based on our experience, is don't be overly prescriptive in telling industry how to achieve the results you desire, but make sure the goals you establish are, are worth reaching. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me turn quickly to uh, the federal role in source reduction and packaging control. From the local perspective, we believe a federal initiative establishing a materials use policy is necessary. Such a policy would include packaging standards and a national packaging reduction goal, limits on the development of new disposable products, reduction in toxic constituent in products that ultimately find their way into the municipal waste stream, incentives for bulk packaging, packaging efficiency as a consideration along with recycled content in procurement policies, and finally, federal efforts to build awareness of and support for source reduction policies. Let me conclude, Mr. Chairman, by just reemphasizing my previous point about the importance of federal le leadership in this area. Source reduction can most effectively be done at the national level. Cities, towns, and counties can have only a limited impact on how products are packaged, how the packages are made, toxic constituent in products, or the volume of products that are disposable. We are constrained in our efforts in these areas, not only by interstate commerce protections, but also by, by local economics. Mr. Chairman, uh, on behalf of the National League of Cities and the Solid Waste Action <coughs> Coalition, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in your hearing, and I'll be happy to answer questions at the top, proper time. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Curtis Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of the Citizens League in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. The uh, Citizens League is a public policy research organization that specializes in citizen participation. But I'm here primarily in the role of having chaired the Governor's Select Committee on Packaging and the Environment in 1989-90. Let me uh, offer you just a very brief background to that and then uh, lift from my prepared testimony the highlights, the things that we recommended. First of all, to, to say that uh, we've only recently begun to make this sort of progress that Councilmember Kramer describes with our environmental legislation. We've had a history going back too far of legislatively just coming together and having the annual battle over somebody's bottle bill. And only in recent years have we adopted the strategy of getting all the folks who have been arguing about these issues in the same room for long enough to see if we can get some kind of consensus on what to do. Uh, we had some success with a initiative called SCORE, which was a select committee on recycling and the environment, which led to some of the state legislation which Mr. Kramer describes as having facilitated the opportunities for recycling. This latest commission called SCOPE was a 29-member group came from city and county governments, people from the waste management industry, from the food processing industry, from trade unions, from glass, plastic, paper, and can manufacturing, along with public interest and environmental groups. In my judgment, the, uh, the uh, appointment of that commission was spurred by, was caused by the actions of six cities led by Minneapolis and St. Paul in taking local initiative making state action necessary. Let me mention two things by way of emphasis that this commission did. Right away it broadened its own scope to say that it was going to deal with more packaging than simply consumer packaging, but look at all packaging in the waste stream. It was also inclined to look at what's left behind in a package as product residue rather than simply the packaging material itself. Second point of emphasis to mention to you is, uh, as you recognize, Mr. Chairman, uh, Minnesota is a state uh, that tends to trust the government at above national averages, tends to use it 
pretty effectively and confidently. But even in that kind of political culture, for this sort of issue, our commission did not recommend a government-dominated strategy. We did not recommend some new command and control procedure with a bureaucracy in charge. And we decided right away we wanted to get maximum effect from market principles and market dynamics. We wanted to set up a partnership between government, consumers as citizens, and business one in which government's role is to ensure reliable collection of these materials so that markets could in fact develop. Where business's role was to get more in the business of taking back the things that they make and reorganizing the manufacturing and distribution system to accommodate that. And the role of consumers and citizens was to make better decisions both when they purchase packaging as well as when they dispose of it. So we emphasized a kind of partnerships and incentives model as opposed to a command and control model. Let me mention the three primary areas of recommendation we came to. First, we committed to reduce discarded packaging on a per capita basis by 25 percent by the end of 1994. Second, to recycle more of those packaging materials that are significant percentages of the waste stream. And in this regard, we proposed setting up a recycling target plan where all materials used in packaging are sorted into material groups and targets and goals are assigned for each of those groups. Some system is to be devised to monitor and measure progress toward those recycling goals. And at the end of the demonstration period, any material group that is not meeting its performance goals would come to bear a packaging fee which we would regard to be a disincentive uh, borne by that product and package in the marketplace, a real incentive for them to make sure that recycling, in fact, succeeds and meets its goals. Uh, the third of these uh, recommendations, clearly the most controversial, was spurred by concern over toxic residues. We proposed a fee on products a registration fee, all products coming into the state of Minnesota containing hazardous chemicals that appear with any measured frequency in landfill leachate and in incinerator ash. In our judgment, this fee would free up money that's now going to pay for management of those products in the waste stream, and thus make more money available for recycling support. It would also provide urgently needed money for the cleanup of leaking landfills. And if I might add, the underlying political objective of this was to make it possible sometime in this decade for any local official to stand up in front of any community, any crowd in that community, and say, we're going to put a landfill here and it's okay. It's all right because nothing's going to be put in it that poses any threat to public health. That's what the third recommendation is all about. The chemical companies in particular were chagrined over a lack of direct participation in the formulation of this recommendation. Uh, they claim claimed and still claim that it is scientifically unwise and economically imprudent and that none of these chemicals has been scientifically demonstrated to be present at levels of saturation that pose any threat to the public health. Uh, we argue instead that uh, when you add them all up, uh, they do make the hazardous list and they do pose a threat and we think they ought to bear this kind of fee. What do we need from the federal government? would echo what Mr. Kramer said uh, and say standards, standards, standards. Uh, the one thing that we refrained from carefully was trying to build our own labeling program or trying to make decisions on a state basis about what constitutes adequate recycle content or when you ought to be able to put a label on a product that says it's recyclable. In our judgment, uh, we shouldn't do that and shouldn't confuse the consumer by putting that on something in the absence of any real opportunity to actually recycle that product. So we hope as you reauthorize RICRA that you will give serious attention to labeling and to standards for recyclability and for recycled content. Uh, we think we stand with you on the verge of a major change in our culture, not simply changes in practices, and we need this vital step in order to assure credibility with citizens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I did bring copies of the entire scope report for distribution. And without objection, uh, that will be made a part of the record as well. Ms. Birmingham. <coughs> Ms. Birmingham. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee. My name is. I think there's a little on? white switch right down on the bottom there. There we go. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. My name is Susan Birmingham. I'm a solid waste policy advocate for the United States Public Interest Research Group, uh, which is the national lobbying office of the state public interest research groups. We have a citizen membership of over a million, uh, and we are active in 31 states in the country on a wide range of consumer, environmental, energy, and governmental reform issues. Mr. Chairman, for such a trivial uh, issue, uh, packaging seems to have many impacts on us. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, uh, $1 out of every 11 um, is spent in, the, spent in the marketplace is spent on packaging. 2.4 quadrillion BTUs annually are, are needed to uh, produce packaging, and of the 20 chemicals listed by the Environmental Protection Agency as most hazardous to public health, five are commonly used in plastics packaging. Additionally, EPA reports 30% uh, and more of the municipal solid waste stream, and if you eliminate food and yard waste, uh, packaging represents over half of municipal solid waste. Market trends for packaging don't provide an encouraging future forecast, quite to the contrary. The amount of packaging produced and consumed in the United States has doubled um, in the last 30 years and is expected to increase from 57 million tons in 1988 to more than 62 million tons in 1995. The specific design trends are also reason for concern. For instance, multi-material packaging, which renders a package non-recyclable, is expected to increase from less than two-tenths of a percent of market share in 1985 to 15.1% 15 in 1995. The Wall Street Journal reports an ex expected increase in single-serving convenience packaging of 13% in 1990 alone. Translated into dollar figures, which the uh, Congressman Pallone from New Jersey uh, spoke of earlier, uh, we are ne in 1988, we we're estimated to spend $65 billion uh, uh, on packaging. Let me just say that even the most superficial product-by-product -product analysis produces staggering figures. In 1991, we will produce 2.2 billion single-serve microwavable trays. Americans use and dispose 115 billion beverage containers, which are disposed of each year, um, with the exception of those collected in uh, states with beverage dis deposit laws. In a 1988 beach cleanup in Texas, 15,600 plastic six-pack rings were found in only three hours. Americans produce enough styrofoam cups every year to circle the Earth 436 times. And each year we throw away 28 billion glass bottles and jars, enough to fill the twin towers of New, York, New York's World Trade Center every two weeks. Packaging is a polluting, uh, polluting generating technology and as such needs regulation. Its production and its disposal exact a toll on tax dollars, human health, and the environment. As an example, the environmental destruction associated with the extraction of processing of oil to provide the raw material for plastic packaging means our loss of fragile ecosystems, we generate hazardous waste, we produce toxic air emissions, and uh, unfortunately we experience catastrophes like oil spills and war. The cost of disposal for states and municipalities is increasing uh, to simply to dispose of packaging we use some OTA figures uh, and uh, estimate that New York State this year will spend $300 million simply to dispose of packaging. Uh, the state of Michigan will uh, spend approximately $175 million, Pennsylvania $131 million, and Texas approximately $248 million simply to dispose of packaging this year. State action on the problem has been, in the absence of federal regulation, uh, fairly explosive. Unfortunately, though, uh, states' impact on national manufacturing processes is minimal in comparison to what can be accomplished at the federal level. The following proposals represent the most significant of the work being done in the states and are, as well, the most appropriate for adoption by the Congress. We offer these not only on behalf of the state public interest research groups, but an array of local, state, and national organizations, including the Sierra Club, Greenpeace, the Environmental Defense Fund, the League of Women Voters of the United States, the Natural Resources Defense Council, and the National Audubon Society. Before I outline these proposals, I'd, li I'd like to say that they are based on the following principles. Number one, that reduction and recycling of our post-consumer waste is in the national interest and is highly appropriate for federal action. Two, interest in and desire to recycle by the majority of the American public is not a passing fi fad, but rather a uh, sustainable political reality which only will increase over time. Three, recycling demands both 
re recycling requires both demand for post-consumer waste and a steady uncontaminated supply of these materials. Four, demand and supply must be mandatory, not voluntary, and standards to ensure demand and supply must be specific rather than left up to the discretion of any particular agency. The first proposal that we uh, submit to the Congress is uh, for reuse and, reci reuse and recycling standards for packaging. Uh, these standards are being, uh, uh, have been um, introduced in 11 state states uh, across the country and specifically um, would mandate that by the year 2000 all packaging would be made of recycled, recyclable, or reusable content. The reason to do this uh, is number one, uh, I think the problem of packaging uh, at, and its volume of the solid waste stream has been stated quite clearly. Uh, number two, that the materials which are used in the manufacturing of packaging actually comprise 70% of MSW. So by requiring standards for recycling, you actually, for packaging, you actually leverage recycling for the other materials in the waste stream. Third, leveraging recycling and reuse by setting standards for packaging should have the least disruptive impact on the nation's manufacturing processes because the packaging industry is the most dynamic and fluid of all manufacturing industries. In fact, on the average, uh, product design for a package changes every two years. And so a standard set by the federal government to meet recycling standards could easily be introduced as a regular part of, the, uh, of their routine design changes. Content standards is quickly becoming a rallying cry for uh, state and local officials around the country um, uh, in order to create market demand and short market demand for post-consumer materials. And if we are to have any real impact on increasing our national recycling rate, which as we know is the lowest of any industrialized, na industrialized nation in the world, content standards create, created through RICRA uh, reauthorization must be mandatory, specific, and with rates that escalate. The second proposal uh, is for a packaging efficiency standard. Uh, again, packaging is a technology that causes pollution and, pollution and as such should be subject to routine perform performance standards. Other pollution generating technologies involved in the supply of consumer services routinely meet efficiency standards in excess of 90% and packaging should be required to meet the standard also. Our third proposal is the implementation of deposit laws because a steady stream of uncontaminated post-consumer waste is necessary if industry is to utilize this material within its manufacturing process. Specifically, we propose a 10 cent deposit system be established for all beverage containers to be refunded directly to consumers upon return. Let me say that deposit systems uh, in the nine states that have implemented uh, them show that this system is the least cost of, uh, least cost and most effective collection system for post-consumer uh, waste which is on the books, which may account for the law's popularity. Over 70% of the American public supports implementation of a federal deposit law. And the experience in those nine states demonstrate how simple and effective the system really is. At no cost to the municipality, municipal solid waste is decreased by approximately 4 to 5% through removal of an average of 80% of all deposited containers. The other thing worth noting about deposit laws, Mr. Chairman, is that virtually 100% of all uh, plastics recycled in this nation, um, along with 50% of all aluminum uh, and two-thirds of all glass is collected from b deposit states. And this is not a m mere coincidence. Uh, implementation of the deposit law for beverage containers is the easiest and most straightforward step that Congress can take to recycle post-consumer waste. The, uh, another proposal, fourth proposal that we propose is tox toxic use reduction in packaging, which I won't go into in detail because it has been mentioned by so many of the panelists. We'd like to see a phase out of um, heavy metals in packaging and chlorine in the pulp and paper industry uh, in order to, to uh, uncontaminate the, the waste stream and make it more easy, easily recyclable. And lastly, we'd like to say that we endorse the uh, we would like to see the, f the federal government uh, mandate standards for the use of environmental claims, and we do endorse the, uh, the uh, bill that has been um, introduced by Congressman Sikorsky and Senators Lautenberg. Um, finally, uh, let me just say that um, the uh, social critic uh, Vance Packard in his 1960 classic, The Wastemakers, wrote that historians may allude to this age as the throwaway age. 
Reauthorization of the Resource Conservation Recovery Act offers us a unique opportunity. We're hopeful that under your leadership, the Congress will realize the opportunity to turn the corner on this excess. We have the opportunity to shape our economy into one that can ensure an efficient and non-polluting materials use policy. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you all very much. Uh, Mr. Kramer, uh, have you had to actually ban any particular packaging materials in, in your situation uh, in Minnesota? Mr. Chairman, uh, our ordinance goes into effect on July 1st of this year. Uh, and the answer to that is perhaps. Uh, it depends on the success of our effort to expand our curbside recycling program to all rigid containers. Uh, referring back to the market question, we're unsure of the market for certain containers, microwave trays, for example, and if we're unable to successfully recycle those by July 1st, then they will be subject to enforcement action. And we don't know how that will work, Mr. Chairman, but we're going to try. And one of the problems with all of this is that it, it's in such a state of flux and, and the, the problem is, is knowing what is the right thing to do. We can go out and do good and screw it all up, too, if we're not, not careful. One of the things that uh, Mr. Johnson said, which frankly is an echo of what some other local officials have told us in the broader context of, of community recycling programs and so forth, is, is <coughs> don't get too prescriptive. Don't take away local government's ability to be innovative in trying to respond to these things. Um, Mr. Johnson, uh, you used a kind of a carrot and stick approach, as I understand it, uh, in which you identify what it is you want to have done, and then if those goals are not reached by a certain time, then the fee kicks in. Mm -hmm. um, in your judgment, is there a parallel that can be used there with a bottle bill? Uh, or would you agree with Ms. Birmingham that you should probably go with a bottle bill? Or is, you know, just initially? Or, or can you set some standards that people can avoid, uh, but with the hammer being a bottle bill if that doesn't, if they don't meet the standards? Mr. Chairman, let me respond in two ways. One is to offer my own perception of why bottle bills never passed in Minnesota. Uh, they were promulgated for the same reasons as they are all around the country. The resistance in Minnesota was not simply resistance to change or vested interests that were threatened, but a strong sense that this would have the effect of skimming off a part of what would otherwise be a more comprehensive market development for recycling, that it would take away the easy part of that market and make it much more difficult for companies which were struggling to get a foothold in this side of the enterprise to make it. So it was resisted for all <coughs> kinds of reasons. The approach we tried to take with the scope recommendations was to look at the biggest picture we could get by with and to design the kinds of dynamics in which Everybody with an interest in this had an incentive to change behavior. That government's making a promise to industry that it's going to collect the things. As Mr. Kramer points out, if you don't have the program and don't have the system for reliable, steady collection, you can't blame industry for not reorganizing itself to cause markets mm -hmm. to develop and to change distribution patterns and ultimately <coughs> even to go through the expense <coughs> and the inconvenience of changing manufacturing patterns. But we do expect, if that steady collection occurs, for industry to change its practices, to find ways to take back those materials, to reuse them. But it wasn't enough simply to induce that with incentives and hope for the best. You know, too much of this whole effort for too long has depended upon the behavior of altruists. So we were, sh we were uh, committed to making sure there were consequences for not doing what people promised. So in the cases of recycling by material group, the consequences come in the form of a fee. Not terribly high, not even yet fixed. We're talking about having a packaging advisory council that would, in the, during the demonstration period, develop these guidelines, provide technical assistance, uh, go through the very difficult work of designing a monitoring and measuring system that actually performs without becoming a nightmare of administration into itself. But at the end of that, 
If you have a material group that didn't meet the performance goal that it agreed to, that it ought to bear that fee. Uh, we were much more severe, one would say, in our treatment of those materials that we judged to be hazardous. And in this case, we said, as soon as possible, <laughs> we want to impose this registration fee, much in the way that the national government has treated the national registration of pesticides. And we want to do that with every chemical coming in in a product that we know when we do surveys of landfill leachate shows up <coughs> and constitutes a threat to the water supply. We want to impose that fee to offer immediate discouragement mm -hmm. to the continued uh, use of those chemicals in those products. And as long as they are going to be there, that at least we generate some funding to deal with their management and with the cleanup that they cause. So it is a combination, Mr. Chairman, of some incentives that all three parties agree to and some consequences to encourage compliance with those incentives. Let me just pursue the one of the things I'm, we're, we're finding in here is that the uh, as as we hear witnesses, we're finding a lot less bifurcation on these issues than we have on environmental issues in the past. Industries that uh, have an economic stake in recycling, uh, in in disposal, uh, sometimes are against industries, and uh, some disagreements within the the uh, environmental slash health slash <coughs> citizen community groups on on issues. Bottle bills is one of those things where obviously there are some industry people that are strongly opposed to it, but the two arguments on bottle bills that that come from the the citizen side of this thing uh, have been presented here. Uh, you've presented the classic argument that bottles being one of the most recyclable of all items is a necessary part of the waste stream and, and therefore should not be uh, cream skimmed. Uh, Ms. Birmingham has presented the PERG view and I was just wondering if she would care to respond to that kind of concern, which I'm sure you've heard before aluminum that we're talking about um, being the most valuable commodity in the waste stream currently. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen no evidence in states which have implemented a bottle bill and which all nine states also have a curbside program uh, that uh, the curbside program cannot exist compatibly with a bottle bill. In fact, our analysis was recently confirmed by the this most recent GAO report which looked at this precise question and found that uh, both systems are indeed compatible and in fact if both are implemented then that is the most uh, th the least cost system to the m municipality um, as well it takes the maximum amount of diverts the maximum amount of materials from the waste stream so that curbside it, a combined system of a curbside program and deposit is cheapest for the, the municipality as well it collects the most amount of material. The, one of the reasons may be that um, curbside is often uh, residential. Um, majority uh, or a significant portion of beverage containers in particular are consumed away from the home so that the amount of beverage uh, uh, containers that can be collected through a, a deposit system is so much higher than can be collected through a curbside system. As well, curbside doesn't lose all of the aluminum uh, cans um, when a bottle bill is implemented. In fact, many people choose to leave the deposited cans in the, um, uh, in the curbside uh, collection system, which are then actually um, uh, the curbside program collects the deposit, which is often higher than what the scrap value would be without the deposit. So all in all, like I say, the, the, um, our analysis was confirmed just recently by the General Accounting Office, which says both, basically mm -hmm. both systems should be, um, should be implemented. It is interesting. I'm not sure it makes our job any easier, but it's interesting when we de-demonize some of these things, when you have people on the same side of an issue who disagree you, you have, you're less likely to have a religious war over the issue because you've got people whose motives can't be uh, questioned uh, who, who have some dis and how we're going to sort that one out, I, I, I don't know. Just a couple of more things. One, I understand that in Germany they're considering or beginning to implement legislation that require retailers to take back packaging. 
excess packaging if the consumer doesn't want it, with the assumption, I gather, that this will provide an incentive to the retailers uh, and, and the manufacturers to not put so much on. Wayne Green, who's publisher of CD Review, has been preaching for years on what our previous panel discussed, make those retailers take all that garbage that they give you around their CDs back. And I, as a loyal CD reader, have been doing that. And they are delighted to take it back. I'm disappointed. I want them to grump and grumble and say no. And then I can tell them that they shouldn't have all this excess packaging and all the rest. And I say, I know when I buy 10 CDs, I say, now take all this stuff off. And they say, sure. And they do. And I throw it away. I guess my question is, is in your experience, do you think this particular idea that the Germans are using will in fact be any uh, incentive to, to reduce waste or will they just happily take it back and dump it in the trash can in back and let the garbage truck come and Mr. take Mr. it away? Mr. Chairman, um, in fact, one of the members of our commission uh, felt so strongly about this, he brought it up at nearly every meeting. It was the representative of uh, the city of Minneapolis on the, on the commission. And our group uh, asked for the Attorney General's office to research the rights of citizens to do this and discovered that it was quite lawful already to do it, there being no legal barriers. So part of our report recommends as a piece of the citizen uh, education that people be told they can do it. And not so much that it's going to by itself change systems, but it does make a statement. Uh, and by doing it, obviously, uh, Retailers are very market sensitive, and if enough people do it, uh, we assume it'll cause a serious rethinking of whether some packaging is excessive. And I guess it would depend on how much the retailer thought the packaging was necessary. Clearly, the CD retailers believe, whether they're right or not, but they believe that they've got a huge pilfering problem that this packaging, so that they might be perfectly happy to assume it. Where, where somebody who, who in fact thought their packaging problem was for a more frivolous reason might have their behavior changed. That seems to make sense. Last point. Uh, we're beginning to wrestle real hard with the problem of state preemption on a lot of these things. And I heard uh, you say, Mr. Johnson, that in, in Minnesota you felt there was a need for national standards rather than state-by-state -state standards, and you uh, approach the problem that way. Uh, states that are large enough to in fact have impact themselves uh, on what national manufacturers do, and I'm thinking particular of California, uh, tend to be strong against preemption. Some of us who, uh, who, who are afraid of balkanizing regulation in the country are somewhat resistant to that. Am I correct in believing that it was because Minnesota uh, doesn't have the cloud in the marketplace that you, uh, that you were not too worried about preemption? Or is your underlying point that this really needs to be done at a national level? Well, Mr. Chairman, um, I think you're partially correct in that we recognize the modest portion of the total national market that we represent. On the other hand, I think our position would be in the relationship between the states and the federal government, very much analogous to the way we felt like the state related to our local governments. We strongly recommended that the state not preempt the right of local governments to take initiatives in this area until and unless it had put in place an acceptable and strong packaging policy framework. That it shouldn't simply preempt that as a matter of uh, principle only do it after it had established something that was adequate at the state level. I think we'd say the same thing to you, that our nervousness about preemption will go away only when the federal government has established an acceptable set of standards. That's not an unreasonable if, position at if all. If I could add to that, my, my concern about preemption, whether it occurs at a state level in re relation to local governments or federal level in relation to state, is that too often it's an attempt to preserve the status quo. And in doing that, we don't move the ball forward on, on these important matters. And so I would agree with, with Mr. Johnson. The, the, the proof is in the pudding in terms of a, a national policy on these matters that are of grave concern to state and fed, uh, local officials. And at that point, if the national policy in, is in place, then I think we're, we're quite satisfied to go on to what's next on the agenda. I think that's it. 
an extremely, what I hear you saying is if, if the federal government will do it right, preemption makes sense. The problem is someone can always argue that the health standard isn't quite as high as it should be, the environmental is not quite as strong as it should be, the labeling information not quite as complete as it should be. Frankly, it's an extraordinarily easy thing to demagogue at the state and local level. Um, so I fear that even, even if we do do what most people would call a very good job, the preemption issue isn't going to go away. Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, ma'am. Our position on this in general would be that it would be very appropriate in this area for the federal government to set standards which would then be seen as the minimum standards, but that innovation um, should always be allowed on the state level um, to take us uh, to take us further so that we would be looking at standards set out by the Congress as yeah. minimum. Frankly, I, as I've tried to think this whole issue through, because we're going to face it in lots of different ways, it, it seems to me there probably isn't a one answer. I think there are some things where you really need to have federal preemption in order for a national market to work well. And there are some other things activities and, and other kinds of things that people want to do in which probably letting the states add to it does nothing to interfere with a rational interstate commerce proposal. And sorting the two out uh, is, is probably what the trick is here. Not necessarily easy, I suspect. You've been very helpful to the committee, and I thank you. Recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and just kind of following up on some of your uh, questions, Mr. Kramer, you talk about na national standards. What, what do you have in mind? What kind of a system do you envision? Kind well, of uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Ritter, I, I gave that uh, some thought, and I should say first that the National League of Cities Subcommittee, which I chair, will be meeting next week to take up that question more specifically, and we can perhaps provide additional information to the subcommittee at that time. But Generally speaking, my view is that uh, what Congress ought to look at is an overall goal for reduction of packaging material and then essentially let industry figure out how they want to get there. And I don't know if that's 10 percent moving to 20 in, in five years or what the, what the numbers are, but uh, I think that there is excess packaging in the system. Uh, and I think that Congress ought to say to industry, look, you've got to reduce that amount of, of packaging by this much and you, you figure out how you're going to accomplish that. In addition, I think that toxic constituent elements of packaging must be banned and I think Congress is in a position to do that over a period of time. And I think Regardless that... Regardless of their chemical activity in, in the system? Well, certainly, uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ritter, science ought to have some bearing on, on how that's done and over what period of, of time, but that's, I'm convinced... That's sort of unrealistic around this town. Though. <laughs> I'm convinced, based on our modest experience in, in Minneapolis, that alternatives do exist to the heavy metal content in packaging material. I know for a fact that one of the major food product companies headquartered in the Minneapolis area has taken as a corporate policy the, el the elimination of heavy metals, and it can be done nationally. Uh, so overall reduction goals, elimination of toxic elements, and then finally uh, some assurance, as Ms. Birmingham in, uh, suggested in her remarks, that the way in which packaging is put together uh, lends itself to recycling. Uh, no multi-resin packages, for instance. Uh, resin types that uh, are most readily, readily reused in the recycling marketplace. Those are three kinds of initiatives that I think Congress can take a look at that are not overly prescriptive that allow industry okay. to, to okay. play an yeah, important I guess, role. So you're, you're saying you would like flexibility, but you're, you're saying that, uh, for example, you know, uh, uh, we shouldn't have more than one kind of resin, but you could have, you could conceivably have multi-resin packages which reduced uh, the uh, amounts of packaging uh, at the source. It would be it constitutes source reduction. I mean, I, I mean, I guess I'm asking: Are you looking? F you're not looking for a command and control system where we're, we're going to run it out of Washington D.C. Are, are you? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ritter, no, I don't think that will be very effective, and I think in doing that you also uh, would tend to stifle what I have found to be great creativity within industry, but I do think it's important for Washington to set a mark for industry to shoot at, and I think it needs to be an aggressive mark in light of the, uh, the very difficult problem so you, we're having with solid waste. you would like to waste. see mandated numbers? I would primarily like to see a, a requirement that overall 
packaging material is reduced in the solid waste stream. That's, I think, the preeminent oh, okay, goal. Okay, I see. But you, you'd be hesitant about taking a mandated number like, say, 9010, which uh, Ms. Birmingham is is sub submitting is a reasonable goal for an individual package uh, i i read the uh, proposal that uh, the coalition of environmental groups have made in that regard and that's something that our committee will take up and make some judgment about what are I your think thoughts that on? i think that may be difficult to uh, to deal with administratively uh, and my general view at this point is that to to try to pre prescribe individual package standards along those lines may be more difficult to achieve than just setting a mark out there for overall yeah, reduction. Yeah, so that's, when you say a mark, you're not necessarily putting a kind of standard hole where all shapes and sizes of pegs would then be pushed through regardless of what the peg was made out of or what, it, what you needed to package and what was necessary to preserve or, or whatever, given the fact that we package millions of different kinds of things. In terms of a source reduction strategy, that's what I'm saying. In terms of toxic elements, I'm saying that Congress can and should be more prescriptive and simply mm -hmm. say no more heavy have metal we found, Have we uh, found that in packaging we have found a uh, uh, serious health problem in in, uh, in, in this country with uh, toxic elements in packages? Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ritter, in, in my earlier remarks, I indicated that as a result of our local initiative, uh, several food product companies did thoroughly re-examine the constituent elements of their packages and did in fact find heavy metal content, which can lead to, to leachate. Yeah, but I guess what I'm irritations. asking is, uh, are, are we aware, and I was asking a very honest question, uh, are we aware of uh, of some kind of uh, significant health risk that is coming, or, may, or health risk at all, that is coming from leachate, from heavy metals, from packages? I, I frankly, you know, trying to do as much reading as I can on, on this whole RICA reauthorization. I, I haven't seen that, but on the other hand, uh, you people are more expert than I am. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Rear, let me just say that I am concerned about that. In the record that was created for the packaging ordinance in Minneapolis, evidence was submitted to the record that uh, leachate from heavy metal content in packaging is a problem nationally. Uh, and, and so that's something that we are concerned about. I will say that the incinerator in Minneapolis uh, 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 periodically exceeds its mercury uh, limitation, and that's as a result of uh, a number of things, uh, household batteries, but also I would contend uh, metal content and, and, and packaging. So, and we're really not quite sure where some of that leachate is derived from. But, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'd like to, and maybe Ms. Birmingham could, could chime in on this. Um, if you if you limit in a very hard and fast way the uh, the amount of uh, packaging that you can have, uh, and you enforce it, is, is it possible that you could lead to increased waste coming into the waste stream? When I think of, uh, for example, uh, my travels in third world countries, the amount of garbage, they don't, they don't produce near as much packaging and, and uh, technology-based material, uh, man-made material, I guess is the way. Uh, but you, you see such an inordinate amount of garbage, and so much of this garbage is food. It's, 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 uh, waste, it's wasted food. And you look at the Soviet Union today, and half of their harvest, because they, they, they don't put it in anything. There's no, I guess, refrigeration is a part of it, but packaging is also a part of this spoilage problem. Uh, you get into uh, tremendous losses and in, in, in product and, and, and additional waste. Has anyone done any uh, look-see at what the implications of that are? Mr. Chairman, there, there are two proposals that um, we're putting forward which are uh, also being aggressively pursued in the states. One is to say that um, uh, packaging uh, by the year 2001 um, should be made of either 35% uh, re post-consumer recycled content should be uh, or reusable or recyclable and allow industry to choose between one of those standards. Um, could use anyone to uh, 
could meet the standard by using any one of those three. By the way, does waste to energy enter into that reuse or recyclable definition? No. Uh, this is uh, utilization of the secondary fibers in a, another product mm -hmm. um, uh, would be considered the definition of recycling. Various product categories to see whether what would happen, uh, economics aside, what would happen uh, in terms of the uh, services being able to be provided to the American public. The first thing, obviously, we looked at is what would, um, in terms of public health uh, and convenience in food packaging, what would be the impacts. Um, there is a lot of confusion out there right now. Um, which we're trying to clarify because there is no, um, the Food and Drug Administration does not preclude using recycled content for food packaging, which is um, unfortunately a uh, misunderstanding, I think, that's out there in, in the public's mind. Um, second, we found no product that could not be currently provided to the American consumer that could not meet this standard. Um, uh, so we're fully confident that there will, would be very little disruption in the marketplace to set a fairly low standard, 35 percent um, glass is already at, uh, uh, I have the If the gentleman would yield, the, the question was I'm sorry. Uh, a, a hard and fast standard uh, on volume oh, of volume. packaging, the 90-10 approach, uh, isn't it possible that that approach could leave a host of material in our economy unpackaged and therefore subject to spoilage or uh, ending up one, one other way in the waste stream or underpackaged or unpackaged or underpackaged leading to, to further uh, garbage uh, generated. Mm -hmm. are, are you thinking of a particular example? Yes, I was thinking of your hard and fast standard of no, I'm 90, a, a product. Volume. Yeah, I was thinking of uh, possibly food uh, is one example, uh, produce. If you don't package it, uh, it's more damage. Yeah. Again. So, so if you don't if you don't package it properly, no, it can I, spoil I and end up being more garbage in the system. Um, we again can't um, we can't come up with the examples of um, products that can't meet these standards that then couldn't be provided to American consumers. We can't, um, we understand your objection and your concern, but when you come down to the specific product by product category analysis, we can't uh, come up with the examples which would um, bring the abstract concern into reality. Mm -hmm. So in, in your mind, uh, this 90, uh, 10, uh, is this by weight? Mm -hmm. 9010 by weight, not by volume. Mm -hmm. uh, is a perfectly a doable economically uh, tomorrow? I guess we can enforce it federally. Is that, I, I mean, I, I just don't know. I just see the number there and I'm just wondering about it. This is uh, based on a proposal that's being uh, promoted by the New York State Legislature, uh, the chairman of the Environment Committee. Uh, uh, Assemblyman Hinchley um, and uh, the New York State Environment Committee apparently thinks that it's a, um, an appropriate uh, and doable standard for their state. So we would like to see that considered by uh, the Congress as a volume reduction measure. Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I have a question for the chair. Are, are, are we at any point going to adjourn? Yes, so we said that we may take advantage of, of the wisdom of the Queen of England. What? Exactly. And we will do that promptly upon the gentleman finishing his questions. At that, with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back the balance of my time. I thank this panel very, very much for your contributions to our understanding of the issue. And I hope that if anything else occurs to you as we proceed with this, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. The committee uh, apologizes to our fourth panel. If there are any of you who have scheduling problems and would like to talk with us, please use that as an opportunity. The chair, uh, however, says we are going to have to, uh, to recess and we will reconvene 15 minutes after the ending of the joint session. He's not in the hall. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and 
subcommittee will come to order. Our, again, uh, the committee's apologies to the witnesses of this panel for the, the delay. You understand uh, why it was necessary, but nevertheless, uh, we hope we haven't unnecessarily inconvenienced you. Our last panel today includes Dr. Deborah Anderson, uh, Ms. Jean Werka, Harry Sullivan, Richard Goldstein, and Paul Petr Petroselli. And uh, as you know, we have already made all of your uh, formal statements a part of the record, and uh, we will recognize you to proceed as you choose and uh, begin with Dr. Deborah Anderson. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I am Dr. Deborah Anderson, Manager, Environmental Quality Coordination of the Procter & Gamble Company. I would like to thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to give input to this hearing. The complex and important issue of packaging and the environment is being addressed by innovative contributions that leaders in consumer products packaging are making to solve our nation's solid waste problems. Being part of the solution rather than part of the problem is important to our company and to our industry. To that end, we have organized to address solid waste with a large investment of resources. I report directly to our CEO, and more than a dozen professionals work with me virtually full time on ways and means of solid waste source reduction, recycling, and composting. Hundreds of line managers and technical personnel in our worldwide organization are working on solid waste issues, particularly source reduction, composting, and recycling as we speak today. Many of our employees are actively recycling in their offices and factories, and we've been proud to work with local officials on composting, plastics recycling, like the Maryland, D.C., Virginia, Close the Loop program, and other infrastructure issues. The subcommittee should consider packaging for all of its benefits, and not as a waste issue per se. Packaging contributes to a better quality of life through avoiding product waste and protecting health. Packaging provides containment, protection, security, reduction of spoilage, and reduction of breakage. Compatibility with the preferred solid waste solutions needs to be considered right along with the functional issues of package design. We see making our packages compatible with solid waste concerns to be a new consumer need just as important as having detergents that clean or diapers that don't leak. This makes the environmental compatibility of our products and packages a key business need. I am seeing incredible energy within our company to make product and package changes to respond to this consumer need. In calendar 1990 alone, our company will use enough recycled plastic to keep out of landfills the equivalent of 190 million half-gallon milk jugs and two-liter soda, soda bottles. In the fabric softener marketplace, a remarkable 40% of our shipments of Downey are now in the refill package. That represents a 75% source reduction over plastic bottles. These success stories point to the power of innovative private sector solutions and the strength of free market forces. My time here is short, so I will briefly show how we are meeting this consumer need for environmentally improved packages and products. My written submission goes into greater detail. I will talk about how we are building environmental compatibility into our products and packages to meet these consumer needs, the importance of consumer education and infrastructure, and what the federal government needs to do to help. First, it should be a goal of any government incentives to provide initiatives, I'm sorry, to provide incentives to make disposal of all packages compatible with integrated solid waste management solutions, especially the more preferred solutions of composting and recycling. We have many examples of how we are doing this, but we're going to need help. And I'd like to show you just a few. This uh, Tide bottle is made with 25% post-consumer recycled plastic. Um, the technology right now uh, only permits inclusion of about 25% because this is a three-layer bottle. Um, three layers of the same kind of resin, but we're working very hard on improving that and expect to improve the content. This bottle is made out of 100% post-consumer recycled polyethylene terephthalate, which is the kind of plastic that two-liter pot bottles are made from. 
This is our downy refill package, which many of you may have seen in the marketplace. Uh, this allows reuse of the downy um, fabric softener original bottle. The consumer, when that bottle is empty, just goes and buys this little refill pack, pours it in the old bottle, dilutes it with water, and essentially it is uh, exactly the same product they would have bought. This is, this is what we mean by compact detergents. Um, this uh, Tide cleans a load of wash with only a couple of tablespoons of product versus what one used to have to use, which was a half to a, a full cup of product. And it comes in a very small box, as you can see. So this is a, a significant source reduction. And I have just one more example that I want to show you. And this is a... Um, way to, this, this is actually an aerosol hairspray, but with this, the consumer uses air to um, pump the product out. So one just pumps it like this and creates their own pressurized aerosol, and this way you get a spray like an aerosol, but without the, um, having to have a propellant in there. Plus, we market a refill as well so that this doesn't have to be thrown away. It can just be filled from a refill package. Um, but we do need help. For example, Congress should give the Food and Drug Administration the resources it needs to clear more recycled materials for use in the very large market for food packaging, a market that is closed to recycled materials until FDA clears them for use. Government should assure that a strategy exists to get the necessary incentives into place. Second, there needs to be key emphasis on clear, concise consumer education on environmental issues. The faster the consumer is educated, the faster the right solutions will be put in place. This is especially important in product labeling. The answer to the labeling issue is federal adoption of uniform labeling guidelines, ethical standards, and definitions. This federal action would put a halt to consumer confusion and the number of conflicting state regulations and level the playing field for co competing products that use environmental claims. Consumer education breeds informed, responsible action. It allows for involvement not just in selection of products, but also in consumer participation in recycling and in voting for the infrastructure facilities needed. The Federal Trade Commission should be encouraged to act promptly on the petition for these guidelines, standards, and definitions. We are very pleased by the initial reaction of the Commission to the inter-industry petition on environmental claims and advertising and labeling. Others on the panel will be addressing that petition in their testimony, and we are very supportive. Along with these guidelines, the delicate balance between too much regulation and enough federal action to assure uniformity needs to be addressed. If competing products make inaccurate or irrelevant comparisons, we expect the first line of review would be the voluntary industry resolution of disputes through the Council of Better Business Bureaus and its National Advertising Division. FTC enforcement actions applying uniform methods and standards would only be necessary after the voluntary system has tried and not achieve successful changes to the claims. Because the need to educate the consumer to make their own choices and to participate in building the infrastructure is so important, federal labeling guidelines, ethical standards, and definitions are the clearly preferred alternative to proposed seal and certification programs such as Green Seal or Green Cross. These programs do nothing to educate the consumer. Instead, they train the consumer to shop for logos. They do not help the consumer understand how buying a product contributes to long-term solutions. Third, there is a clean, clear need for federal support for infrastructure growth. By infrastructure, we mean the interdependent system of collection, reprocessing, and end-use market development without which composting and recycling cannot succeed. We recommend that the Congress consider incentives such as grants for construction of local recycling and composting facilities, transportation incentives for recyclables rooted by rail or truck, making sure that collection systems take all recyclables, not just a few, giving incentives for the states to collect more types of plastic bottles, procurement of compost and products with recycled content to increase markets, applying the purchasing power so very important to building demand in the national marketplace specifying compost use wherever possible on land reclamation and highway projects, and encouraging municipalities to use volume-based fees, such as a per can fee for collecting solid waste. 
to bring home the message of source reduction to the consumer. Clearly, building the infrastructure calls for a shared responsibility between all sectors, government, consumers, and the private sector. Fourth, we need an appreciation of where we need to legislate and where we need to let private forces work without impediments. As I said before, building environmental compatibility into Product and Gamble, Procter & Gamble's products is a consumer need and therefore a key business issue to us. The changes we are making are not only stimulated by our concern for the environment, but also by this business need. If we don't change, we're going to be out of business. This illustrates the power of free market forces at work. Source reduction is another example of these incentives already in place to induce companies to reduce their costs by reducing waste. Companies for many years before the environmental issue are constantly trying to find ways to reduce packaging and their use of materials for purely economic reasons. The subcommittee should recommend legislation only where it is truly needed because of the absence or failure of free market forces to do the job. In our written submission, I have suggested why bottled bills do not help us to meet our long-term goals for solid waste solutions. I have also briefly discussed life cycle analysis in my written submission. Because the science base for this technology is in such an early stage of development, we believe that any legislation touching upon life cycle analysis is not appropriate at this time. In closing, let me reemphasize. The Congress should encourage package disposal compatibility with the solutions of integrated waste management, especially composting and recycling. The federal government should strongly support labeling guidelines, ethical standards, and definitions, such as those currently in the FTC petition. Legislation is not needed at this time. Because of the urgent need for consumer education, such labeling guidelines, standards, and definitions are to be preferred over any seal or certification programs. The Congress should provide for building the interdependent infrastructure of collection, reprocessing, and end-user markets that is so critical to the establishment of composting and recycling. And last, the subcommittee should be careful not to hinder by legislation the role that free market forces will play in making these necessary changes. Legislation is needed only where innovation by the private sector cannot produce improvements in our mutual desire for environmental quality. Thank you very much. Dr. Anderson, thank you. Uh, Ms. Jeannie Worka. Can you? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Jeannie Worka. I'm the Solid Waste Policy Analyst for Environmental Action Foundation. Environmental Action Foundation is a Washington, D.C. based national nonprofit environmental group. We conduct research on packaging and the role of materials in solid waste management. On behalf of Environmental Action, the Clean Water Action Project, the Environmental Defense Fund, Greenpeace, the Natural Resources Defense Council, the Sierra Club, and the U.S. Public Interest Research Group, I'd like to thank the committee for the, the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify on this important issue. I won't reiterate the, the many statistics you heard this morning outlining the packaging problem, except to say that the explosion of packaging materials in the last 30 years and their low recycling rate is due in part to the fact that the use of virgin materials is a relatively cheap way to deliver and market products. The blister pack of nails, for example, has replaced a clerk behind a counter in a hardware store. Prepackaged meat has replaced the butcher, largely because materials are a cheaper way of delivering products um, in these cases than labor. Without making any value judgments on that issue, I simply want to say that the over-reliance on the use of virgin materials to deliver goods to consumers is taking a heavy toll on the environment. It consumes vast amounts of raw material, contributing to the enormous environmental degradation associated with the extraction and processing of resources, it consumes vast amounts of energy as well. About 3% of our entire national energy budget goes for the production of packaging. That's roughly equivalent to 400 million barrels of oil, or to put it another way, twice the amount of oil we import, or at least used to import, in a full year from Iraq and Kuwait combined. Uh, once discarded, as you know, packaging comprises an inordinate share of municipal solid waste. As you heard Susan Birmingham say this morning, American consumers are paying for this packaging waste, both coming and going. 
some of the comparison shopping we did as part of Congressman Pallone's Waste Watch program um, shows that overpackaged goods can be more expensive than less packaged alternatives by some 44 to 1500 percent. After it's thrown away, consumers pay for packaging again through skyrocketing disposal costs. New York State, for example, is spending more than $300 million a year to get rid of packaging waste. Now, at a time when states are cutting funds for education, police protection, and other social services, packaging manufacturers continue to burden taxpayers with millions of dollars in disposal costs by adding unnecessary materials or non-recyclable materials to their packaging. Remarkably, while federal and state regulations govern the efficiency with which we use our energy resources through such measures as appliance efficiency standards and fuel efficiency standards for motor vehicles, no existing federal regulations govern the efficiency with, with which we use materials for packaging. RICRA reauthorization provides a unique opportunity to reorient our nation's economy from one that squanders materials and energy to one that conserves and recycles. Congress must act now to enact policies that address materials use, especially the demand and supply of recycled materials. These policies must be mandatory, aggressive, and apply to all packaging materials equally. Congress should not give EPA discretion to determine whether or when to move on packaging reform. And on this regard, I just wanted to add a, an additional note, which is that EPA has been talking about source reduction for many years now but has taken almost no, very little action. In fact, one of the most positive steps that EPA has taken recently was the release of a consumer handbook in October of 1990, which, like many consumer handbooks for environmental shopping, simply gave <coughs> consumers guidance on how they could um, reduce packaging, purchase more recyclable packaging, compost their food waste in their backyard, and so forth. But remarkably, in February, EPA pulled this handbook largely in response to pressure from a number of consumer products companies and their trade associations who were concerned that p consumers might actually take EPA's advice and change their purchasing behavior. I remind you that this was not a command and control regulatory approach on EPA's part. It was a voluntary educational effort simply um, designed to give consumers options on how they might change their purchasing and household habits. Our concern is that if these companies who pressured EPA to, to pull this handbook cannot accept even voluntary educational strategies, and EPA is very willing to defer to these industries' concerns, um, that does not bode well for voluntary action in the area of packaging reform. We believe that the following key policies are crucial for a national effort on packaging reform. First, mandatory diversion rates. The, tra the transition to a recycling economy will require that manufacturers have a steady and reliable supply of high quality secondary materials. Congress must require that the majority of recyclable materials are deferred diverted from disposal. We are calling for mandatory diversion rates of 65% of all glass, 65% of all papers, 80% of all metals, and 50% of all plastics. Second, mandatory recycled content standards. Recycling programs around the country have learned the hard way that inadequate demand can cripple even the best laid plans for collection programs. Some states have moved aggressively to address this problem, enacting mandatory recycled content standards for materials like newsprint and even glass and plastic containers. As a market development, as, as a major market development tool, we need mandatory federal recycled content standards for all packaging materials of at least 35 percent post-consumer content by 1996, 50 percent by the turn of the century. In conjunction with mandatory diversion rates, which will provide the supply of needed materials, such standards are achievable given current technology. In fact, you've seen some of the examples here today of some of the technological achievements in the plastics industry in using recycled content. Um, I would like to mention also that the glass industry recently supported California's law calling for 65 percent recycled content in glass containers. Again, it is essential that recycled content standards be mandatory and applied equally to all packaging materials. 
The discretion to decide on content standards should not be left to EPA, nor should it be kicked to a packaging advisory board. Our own experience working with state level and regional advisory bodies or task forces has shown that in the absence of clear, precise legislative mandate, this approach is largely unproductive. Third, design standards for recyclability and materials efficiency. Recycled can content standards for packaging, in addition to providing needed markets, will also ensure that packaging is designed to be recyclable. If industry is made responsible for turning old packaging materials into new ones, we can be sure that packages will be designed to be as easy to recycle as possible. But recyclability certainly is not enough. We need to reduce the amount of material used in the first place. We need federal standards for materials efficiency in conjunction with recycled content standards. Such standards should limit the amount of packaging material used per unit of product. Fourth, container deposits. The bottle bill, which has been enacted by nine states, has proven to be the most effective, efficient, and economical mechanism for collecting beverage containers, resulting in re redemption rates for beverage containers in the 90% range in each state. We need a federal bottle bill that requires a minimum 10 cent deposit on all beverage containers. We need a system for recovering the unredeemed deposits, which are now pocketed by the beverage industry, to be used to fund other recycling programs. Fifth, regulation of environmental marketing claims. Consumers have demonstrated a willingness to alter their purchasing behavior to buy more recyclable packaging or packaging made with recycled materials, only to be met with misrepresentation, half-truths, or just plain lies in some of the marketing claims made by manufacturers. For example, consumers can now buy polystyrene cups that say that they're recyclable, even though the vast majority of Americans do not have access to recycling systems for them. Um, recently, consumers were confronted with advertisements that disposable diapers were compostable, even though the technology needed to compost that type of product is not very widespread and fraught with environmental controversy. We support the approach taken in the Environmental Marketing Claims Act of 1991, which was introduced mm. by Congressman Sikorsky and Senator Lautenberg because it sets minimum standards that manufacturers must meet before they make environmental claims, which will provide the consistency needed in the marketplace to give consumers confidence. Finally, we need a federal ban on the use of heavy metals like lead, cadmium, mercury, and hexavalent chromium in packaging materials to reduce the toxicity of the waste stream. Eight states have already passed such bans. I would like to point out to the subcommittee that uh, this legislation has been supported by a broad cross-section not only of environmental groups but of industry as well. In addition, Congress should act, act to phase out sources of chlorine in the waste stream, uh, including polyvinyl chloride packaging and the chlorine bleaching of paper products. There's no question here today that we need the services that packaging provides. But delivering goods to the marketplace will not suffer if the amount of materials used for packaging is reduced. Nor will it suffer if recycled materials or reusable packages are used instead of virgin resources. The naturalist, poet, and essayist Wendell Berry hit the problem on the head when he wrote, our economy is such that we cannot afford to take care of things. Labor is expensive, time is expensive, money is expensive, but materials, the stuff of creation, are so cheap that we cannot afford to take care of them. Congress must act now to take care of our material resources and energy by enacting man mandatory diversion rates for recyclable commodities, mandatory recycled content standards to get industry to use those commodities, design standards for packaging recyclability and efficiency, a ca container deposit law for ma maximumly efficient collection, regulation of environmental marketing claims, and bans on heavy metals and other toxics in packaging. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair would like to engage in an unusual procedure, and that is the gentleman from Pennsylvania has a, a, another schedule that, uh, that did not take into consideration the fact that the Queen uh, was going to delay us. And I would like to, to recognize him for some questions, and I would hope the whole panel would feel free to participate and then we'll go back and hear the testimony from the other three witnesses. Recognize the gentleman. From I thank Pennsylvania. you very much for uh, your graciousness, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to uh, first ask uh, Ms. Workman uh, just to, to cover this uh, alleged 
recall of an EPA uh, handbook at the request of industry groups. Now, it would seem to me just, uh, that, that such a handbook would be the kind of uh, guidance to consumers that we all could agree on, uh, that it's not a command and control centralized system. It's the kind of thing that could be very helpful. I was wondering if some of the people here representing the uh, possible uh, promoters of recall the uh, Grocery Manufacturers Association, Food Marketing Institute uh, representatives. Do you want to comment on this briefly, please? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that industry had no input on the EPA handbook, uh, Mr. Ritter, and that there were many inaccuracies in it, and we would be glad to provide as an industry group, I can state on behalf of the grocery manufacturers industry, a written description of the inaccuracies to the subcommittee. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that uh, these, uh, this written submission be made a part of the record at the appropriate uh, point. Without objection, and the chair would ask unanimous consent that the pamphlet itself be made a part of the record. Any, any other comments? For yes, I, I would just like to put forward the perspective that I think that anyone who read the draft of this booklet would have been concerned. It was a about, draft uh, still, or was it a final product? The final product okay. would have been concerned. Um, I think that our concern was not on the part of industry, it was on the part of any person in the public who would read this book. For example, it suggested that people should mix household products to clean their houses after we spent many years here encouraging people not to mix household projects because people have died from mixing bleach and ammonia. And, uh, you know, so there were very, very uh, severe safety issues, and uh, I think that these will be covered in the... For the record, I'd just like yeah. to point out that the household products um, that, that are being referred to here are items commonly found in any kitchen, such as baking soda, lemon juice and vinegar, which are all basically food items which don't really pose much of a risk, um, such, whereas bleach and ammonia clearly do. I'm sorry, it sets a precedent. I uh, have some other questions. Ms. Anderson, you uh, stated that FDA rules prevent you from using more recycled materials. Um, are these uh, rules there because there are health risks? Uh, posed by uh, some of these products, or are they, are they somehow obsolete? Uh, that they represent uh, the idea is that somehow, if a material is recycled, it's 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 somehow dirtier or of poorer, or le lesser quality. Could you just uh, well, expand I think on I think these laws um, reflect the concern that anything that's in contact with food needs to be qualified as safe, and the research hasn't been done yet to show that recycled plastic. Um, is safe in all these contexts or what has to be done with it to make it safe. And what we are encouraging is that this work get done quickly and that FDA move forward and get these approvals finished so that we can use recycled materials in this whole other area of packaging. In other words, uh, somehow these recycled materials are unclean by FDA rules and therefore if they are food related they can't be Y well, recycle, one has to prove used that in, 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 a, in, in new food uh, applications? The, re the research has to be done to prove that they are clean. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the, the point is that given the fact that uh, we're dealing with food that is ingested... Is this research or is this testing? Or it's what? testing. Uh, I can tell you that, I mean, the process has been quite extensive, but I, I show you today uh, one of the first, I think the first bottle that has now, this is PET, uh, it contains 25 percent recycled material. It's the first food container with recycled materials to come into direct contact with food. Uh, it is recycled and this has just been approved by the FDA. Okay. So the process is, is going and I think to Dr. Anderson's point, we are, we are anxious to assist the regulatory authorities in seeing to it that the approval process moves as quickly as possible. I think it demonstrates once again that, that industry is trying to do its part uh, in bringing to the market uh, pr uh, containers. I think, it, I think this, uh, Mr. Chairman, I know we do not have jurisdiction over FDA, but I think this is part of a larger question in, in the, uh, in the, uh, that deals with the incentives to use recycled materials for uh, new products without having the onus 
of having been used for uh, something before, even though scientifically health effects wise there is no relationship uh, and, and we need to do the kind of testing that, that proves that, uh, but uh, I think we want to put all the incentives we can into the system so that if it is safe we should be able to use it and we shouldn't be bound by obsolete rules that uh, defy science. Um, Ms. Anderson, one, one last question. You stated that uh, life cycle analysis is not yet to a point to serve as a basis of public policy. Uh, shouldn't we be developing uh, the science of, of life cycle uh, analysis? Isn't this the kind of analysis we should seek to base our choices on? Absolutely. I think that um, the concept of life cycle analysis is a sound concept and that manufacturers such as we are very anxious to be able to use this in helping us make decisions around uh, the environmental compatibility of our products and packaging. I think that the issue here is that um, the scientific community is still working some very complex scientific issues around how to do a, knife, a life cycle analysis and I don't believe it's ready yet for any kind of legislative action because the technology needs to be, uh, needs a lot of work yet. Could, could I just add to that? I, I agree with Dr. Anderson on that point and just to, for your information, EPA has an ongoing um, project on the development of the methodology, a better methodology for life cycle analysis, um, which Procter & Gamble is part of, Environmental Action is part of that project as well in a peer review capacity. And we would agree that at this point the methodology is not at a point where it can be used for policy decisions, um, primarily for the reason that although the, the methodology today can be used to sum up the different environmental releases um, from different from different types of production processes, there's no way today, and this is one of the things that's being worked on, to compare the relative impact of those. In other words, you can say, um, and Mr. Ritty, you mentioned the, the, the polyfoam cup earlier um, in the hearing, you can say that a foam cup has 42 percent fewer air emissions than um, a, a comparable paper cup. What you cannot say is that, that for those those releases that are released are less harmful than um, releases from another production process. In other words, the, the relative risk is something that's like risk analysis yeah. is a real um, tough nut to crack yeah. and there are many good minds working on the, yeah. the problem right now. Well, I am a strong supporter, as you know, of trying to get at least the best possible science we can and to, to at least take into account these issues of relative risk. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield back the balance of my time and wish all of you uh, a very pleasant uh, weekend. I thank the gentleman and uh, I, I, I wish him uh, well in his next appointment. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. Our next witness is Mr. Harry <coughs> Sullivan with FMI. Mr. Thank you, Sullivan. Mr. Chairman. FMI is a nonprofit association conducting programs in research, education, public affairs on behalf of our 15,000 members food retailers and wholesalers and their customers in the, in the United States and overseas. Our domestic members operate approximately 19,000 retail food stores with a combined annual sales volume of 180 billion, more than half of all grocery sales in the United States. I'd like to share our perspective on the complex and controversial subject of solid waste management and highlight some of the projects and programs our industry has initiated over the last few years and provide an overview of our position on some of the key issues you'll, which you will confront as you draft the RICRA reauthorization bill. The issue of solid waste disposal is important to food retailers and wholesalers for two reasons. First, we transport millions of tons of product from farms and manufacturing facilities to our warehouses and stores every day of the year. Moving these goods from the farm to consumers requires appropriate packaging in the form of pallets, shrink wrap, and corrugated boxes. Second, and perhaps even more important, supermarkets function as the purchasing agent for the consumers and serve as the primary contact with the public interacting with the food industry. When consumer issues develop, supermarket managers will be among the first to hear about them. According to our member companies, 
shoppers are concerned about the types and the amount of packaging they see in the supermarket and are beginning to demand changes. Food retailers and wholesalers also serve as the distribution agents for producers and processors and as such occupy a visible and influential position in the product supply chain. FMI has been working with our member companies over the last few years to help them re-examine their business practices to see where changes can be made in the light of growing solid waste problems. Let me share a few of the highlights. In 1988, FMI formed a task force to study the solid waste issue and make recommendations on how the food distribution industry should respond to the burgeoning waste disposal programs. A policy was formally adopted by our board in May of 1989. The policy urges retailers and wholesalers to actively participate in the development of comprehensive community solid waste programs, which emphasize source reduction and recycling, particularly curbside recycling. To work with suppliers to reduce the amount of materials used in packaging and to make packaging more recyclable without compromising food safety and quality. To establish in-house programs to separate and recycle disposables. To reduce in-house packaging in the deli, bakery, meat, produce departments. And to educate our employees and consumers about the need for solid waste management. We've instituted several programs designed to help the industry respond to solid waste disposal challenges. These programs can be grouped into four broad categories. Education, research, industry relations, and legislations. Details on all of these are in a written testimony, but I'll call attention to just a few. In the area of education, last February we held our first freestanding FMI Environmental Affairs Conference, focusing on practical information needed to get uh, recycling, composting, and source reduction programs off and running. Two of our speakers on that program, by the way, was a fellow panelist, uh, Gene Worka, and on a previous panel, uh, Councilman uh, Kramer was one of our speakers. We've added a new bi-monthly newsletter, the Environmental Report, uh, providing a steady stream of new information and ideas to implement company environmental programs. We have produced a new consumer brochure and a videotape entitled Reduce, Reuse, and Recycle, You and I Can Make a Difference. The brochure and the eight-minute video were designed for audiences with little knowledge of the solid waste issue and provide a list of practical ways consumers can practice the, quote, new three R's, unquote, at home. And then last but not least, we're in the final stages of developing a supermarket waste reduction manual that will serve as a how-to guide in developing source reduction programs for stores, offices, and our warehouses. In the area of research, we've conducted two major studies in the last two years. The first was a member company survey to determine what food retailers and wholesalers are already doing and planning to do to address the solid waste crisis. The survey revealed that 84% of the wholesaler and large retailer members who responded were already collecting recyclables at the distribution centers. Nearly half, 45%, were tracking their solid waste disposal costs and tonnage. An update is planned on that survey later this year. In a second report, FMI and Better Homes and Gardens magazine released a survey of consumer attitudes on solid waste and packaging. The results are publicized at, were publicized at our FMI convention in May of 1990, and the major findings of that survey are included in our statement. Copies are also available uh, in a freestanding form. In the area of industry relations, there's no one solution to the solid waste problem. Managing waste in the most environmentally effective way will require a combination of approaches and a pooling of talent and resources. 
Many important goals will be achieved only if grocery product manufacturers, wholesalers and retailers find ways to cooperate and coordinate our efforts to facilitate industry relations and, and to create a unified industry plan, FMI and the Grocery Manufacturers of America were recently joined by several other organizations in creating the Grocery Industry Committee on Solid Waste. The committee is co-chaired by Phil Lippincott, Chairman and CEO of Scott Paper Company, and Jim Moody, Chairman and CEO of Hannaford Brothers uh, Company. It's their mission to develop, implement, and support joint industry grocery projects and programs that contribute to the advancement of a national integrated waste management system. Uh, your next witness, Richard Goldstein, or uh, President and CEO of Unilever United States, will tell you more about that committee and what we've accomplished to date. Moving to legislation, um, we feel that the government has an important role to play as reflected in our policy statement on solid waste. That policy statement also directs FMI to con undertake programs to promote uniform national standards for materials used in packaging and handling in the food industry, to promote federal initiatives that increase the national recycling rate that facilitate the adoption of comprehensive solid waste management plans at the state and local level, to work with government and industry to develop better recycling infrastructures, which will create stable markets for materials being recycled. Therefore, we are in favor of RICRA legislation advances that advances these objectives. In the 101st Congress, FMI supported the subcommittee's RICRA legislation. We took particular interest in the overall premise of fostering comprehensive solid waste management planning at the state and local level. Its provisions to stimulate markets for recyclable materials, the Waste Reduction and Recycling Information Clearinghouse, and the Presidential Commission on Waste Reduction, which would have industry, public officials, and environmental groups developing recommendations for waste reduction and labeling regarding consumer packaging. As a direct link with the public, uh, as a direct link with the public as consumers, the American grocery store is uniquely positioned to be a facilitator of change. Informed buying power is a major driving force behind the change to more environmentally responsive packaging and shopping habits but policies that impose bans or mandatory deposits, while symbolically very appealing, are disruptive, inefficient, and ultimately ineffective. State and local governments do, want to, do not want federal dictates. The subcommittee's recent RICRA hearings showed this. We believe legislation like H.R. 945, the Comprehensive Recycling Act, recognizes that overall philosophy. If we're serious about achieving high recycling rates, then this is the proper approach for the federal government to establish, a framework that can guide state and local planning of recycling programs. Packaging ends up as a potential contributor to the waste stream which we all want to reduce, recycle, and deal with more effectively. The public can play a powerful role in this process. FMI would like to see consumers be able to avail themselves of environmental information on products or at the point of purchase that help guide them in making the purchasing decisions they want to make. The information must be clear and accurate, claims must not be misleading, and the terms or guidelines that govern this process must be nationally uniform. And that is why FMI joined the National Food Processors Association and others in petitioning the, FD, the Federal Trade Commission for industry guides on environmental claims. In conclusion, with the solid waste issue, we're beginning a journey that will take us well into the next century. Many in the food industry are frustrated by the tendency of consumers to seek redress for life's problems in the supermarket. Many have asked, 
Why should our industry be the leader in this movement? Dean Wearies, chairman of Fleming Companies and the immediate past chairman of FMI, provided a concise answer when he said, because of our high visibility with consumers, we are perceived as a major source of the solid waste problem, and we cannot permit our industry to be cast as a villain. Environmentalists are not our enemies. We share the same concerns and want to work in cooperation to find realistic solutions. As an industry, we're committed to playing a strong role because it is the right thing to do and because we will surely see impractical solutions if we do not play an active role. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, Richie Goldstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am Richard Goldstein, President and Chief Executive Officer of Unilever United States. Unilever is a worldwide consumer products company with eight operating units in the United States, including Lever Brothers, Thomas J. Lipton, and Cheeseboro Ponds. I'm testifying here today on behalf of the Grocery Manufacturers of America, a trade association whose members manufacture 85 percent of the food and non-food products sold in this country, and the Grocery Industry Committee on Solid Waste. This is an unprecedented coalition of manufacturers and retailers of grocery products that is assisting policymakers mm. in developing market-based solutions for solid waste problems. As an industry, Mr. Chairman, we are currently doing quite a lot in minimizing packaging, incorporating recycled materials to the extent available, designing packages that are recyclable or reusable, and recycling opportunity, uh, recycling waste in our own facilities. Our efforts are consistent with the EPA's hierarchy of integrated waste management, namely source reduction, recycling, composting, incineration, and landfilling. And they're consistent with the GMA's own statement of environmental principles, which has been adopted by the board of directors of that organization. GMA members are committed to integrated solid waste management plans at local, state, and federal levels of government. We are also providing consumers, employees, and government with factual information and educational materials describing how our industry is doing its fair share to alleviate the solid waste problem. As consumer products companies, we are driven by our consumers' needs as well as safety and environmental considerations. Any federal or local solid waste management program must recognize that consumers may be hesitant to buy packages solely for their environmental attributes. Therefore, as an industry, we believe that any legislative solutions must be developed in the context of consumer safety and acceptance. It is critical to balance the requirements of providing packaging that meets a variety of competing demands, including health and safety, product protection, durability, consumer value, and merchandising appeal, with the need to conserve energy and minimize waste. The grocery manufacturing industry is making progress in reducing packaging at its source. In the May 1991 edition of the National Geographic, the noted garbage archaeologist William L. Rathjay points out that businesses seek to eliminate excess packaging with the same fervor as the most ardent environmentalists. The standard technique for edging out the competition, he refers to it as light weighting, making the same item with less material. Illustratively, the two-liter soda bottle, this one here, this size here, was 68 grams in 1977. It's now 51 grams. Plastic gallon milk jugs have gone from 98 to 60 grams. Lighter means not only thinner, but it's also more crushable. Now, grocery manufacturers and their suppliers are leaders in the design of new products and packaging that reduce weight at the source. For example, at Lever Brothers, we have developed a product called Wisp Power Scoop. I'll show it to you shortly. It's a super concentrated powdered detergent in 25% smaller package. Procter & Gamble, as my colleague Dr. Anderson has pointed out, has made similar package reductions. Kraft General Foods has eliminated 1 billion pounds 
in potential waste over the next 10 years by taking internal initiatives. Nabisco Foods has saved two and a half million pounds of plastic by reducing the weight of their margarine tubs. Pepsi-Cola and Coca-Cola have reduced the amount of material in their aluminum cans by 36 percent. As for recycling, we're striving to reach the 25 percent recycling goal called for by the EPA by developing products and packaging that can be recycled and by using recycled materials in our packages. Let me share with you, if I might, just a few examples. This box of uh, Kellogg's Corn Flakes, is, the outside box is 100 percent recycled material. Uh, other cereal manufacturers are also doing this. This uh, Reynolds wrap, the carton and core are made of 100 percent recycled paperboard and they're printed with water-based inks so that we don't have the metallic issues that have been referred to earlier. This bottle here of uh, Heinz ketchup is made of PET plastic. It's 100 percent recyclable. Mr. Chairman, this took the Heinz company four years and four million dollars to develop. Now, the bottle, and we'll talk more about this in terms of what happens to the bottles in a little while longer, but if there isn't a place for this to go and if there isn't a way to recapture it, that all gets lost. But the good news is, is the company at their initiative have taken steps to see to it that this product here can be recycled. I mentioned to you before the reduction of 25 percent in packaging, which is source reduction, which is, comes out of concentrating detergents, and this is a good example of it from one of our own companies, the Wisp Power Scoop. This bottle here is made of uh, high-density uh, polyethylene. It's plastic containing 25 percent post-consumer recycled plastic, another good example of where the industry is utilizing virtually as much recycled plastic as we can get our hands on. I think I've got just one more, and that's also in the food area. This is source reduced. There's no in a cooking tray or plastic lid to throw away on this one here, as, as has been the case. It's another example, as was pointed out earlier this morning, of where you can do away with a, a layer of, uh, of packaging. Now, the percentage of recycled material used by GMA members in containers and packaging materials varies widely due to the availability of materials, as I've pointed out, scientific and technological considerations, and product safety. Although we use recycled materials, we strongly oppose mandatory percentage requirements for recycled content, particularly if mandated through differing and inconsistent state and local legislation. The results may mean increased cost to the consumer and clearly forebode disruption of to national distribution. As an industry, we also do not support the establishment of a federal board with authority to regulate packaging. Any such board should be advisory only. Let me shift and talk on the issue of environmental labeling claims, if I may. Leaving the terms or definition of terms of such as recyclable to local or state jurisdictions is extremely ill-advised in our judgment. Economic and distribution considerations would preclude separate advertising or packaging for different geographic areas resulting in de facto ban on such claims. Our view is that national guidelines for environmental marketing claims are indeed the right answer. Now, the Grocery Industry Committee and the GMA were signatories on a petition to the Federal Trade Commission requesting the promulgation of industry guides on, quote, green labeling. We played an important role in developing that document the National Food Processors Association is here today, and I won't take up any time talking about what you're going to hear about directly from them, but we support the initiative. In this entire area, Mr. Chairman, we believe that the marketplace solutions are the preferable to, far preferable to government regulation. The reason is that market-driven activities foster innovation. The Grocery Industry Committee is developing methods for stimulating the end markets through a series of market development projects directly related to the waste this industry generates. And they include recycling stretch wrap, 
corrugated cottons, post-consumer plastic grocery bags, plastic bottles and shipping pallets, and composting grocery store waste. In draft manuals on how to begin a composting program for grocery store waste and how to launch a recycling program for the plastic bags which the industry uses will be available early this fall. And reports are also being prepared on all of the other projects which we've mentioned. GMA member companies believe that the best way to tackle the solid waste issue is through the development of a comprehensive solid waste management plan with participation by both the public and the private sector. Under the leadership of the GMA and the Grocery Industry Committee, we developed a white paper on solid waste legislation. The white paper outlines the underlying policy, practices, and direction, the principles that, are, that all governments, all levels of government have a role. First, they set realistic waste reduction and recycling goals with input from business, government, and other groups and the public based upon practical planning and adequate consideration for cost, feasibility, and capacity. Second, determine the type and the kind of the in infrastructure best suited for any given area, and it will certainly differ from locality to locality. Third, Assume responsibility for long-term capacity assurance and for resolving the siting disputes. And fourth, stimulate the development of end markets for recycled materials. Fifth, eliminate local and state packaging bans, mandates, and discriminatory taxes to ensure a functional market-based system of waste management. All segments of society contribute to the solid waste problem and must therefore help fund that infrastructure. We're not just talking about equity, but rather behavioral changes which are essential to the resolution of the solid waste problem. Throughout the white paper, the underlying assumption is that an integrated waste management infrastructure is the critical component required for dealing with the country's solid waste problem. We note Congressman Tozen's support of the comprehensive approach to recycling through his recently introduced Comprehensive Recycling Act of 1991, H.R. 945, I believe. It is necessary for all levels of government to work together to see that this waste management system is put in place. Recycling is a very important part of this infrastructure, but just one component. We also recognize that state-of-the-art waste-to-energy incineration and safe, cost-efficient landfilling must also be developed. The recycling systems you as policy makers will devise will serve as the principal method for separating, collecting, and ensuring an adequate supply of recycled material. We need to have an efficient system for getting a critical mass of materials to the end markets to assure recyclers a reliable, economically efficient volume of material so that industry can continue the initiatives which have been started. In summary, Mr. Chairman, the grocery industry is committed to working with this subcommittee and the Congress to help create solutions to solve the solid waste crisis. And we urge you to focus on the development of a national uniform framework that emphasizes a coordinated local state and federal government plan to develop a comprehensive infrastructure to manage solid waste. This will include all of the essential components such as minimization of the source, recycling the end with end markets, waste to energy incineration, and safe land filling. Finally, we believe the grocery industry has made impressive gains in reducing solid waste through individual company initiatives. Collectively, we have made it a top business priority and believe that we have a clear responsibility to devote significant scientific and technological resources to solving this problem. We are determined to find innovative and practical answers that will strengthen both our industry and our society. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Our, our last witness, Mr. Paul Petroselli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Paul Petroselli, and I'm Senior Food and Drug Counsel with Kraft General Foods. Kraft General Foods is the second largest food company and the largest in the United States. Our company employs 100,000 people worldwide. We operate 200 manufacturing plants and produce some 2,500 packaged products 
package in every existing packaging material. I am testifying today on behalf of the National Food Processors Association. NFPA's more than 500 food processors and their suppliers appreciate this opportunity to be heard on the packaging issues affecting the food industry in the RICRA reauthorization process. Written testimony has been submitted for the record, and I will just highlight that testimony. Our food manufacturing and distribution system is a dynamic mechanism which is constantly re responding to consumer demands. The needs of two wage earner households, single parents, and an increasingly elderly population have all been addressed through a variety of packaged food products. I am here today to ask you and the members of the subcommittee to let the food and other industries respond again to consumer demand, this time to the clearly identified concern of consumers over the environmental effects of packaging they buy. As has been mentioned earlier, NFPA led a broad-based industry initiative which resulted in our filing a petition with the Federal Trade Commission in February of this year, requesting that the Commission promulgate voluntary industry marketing guidelines for environmental claims. A copy of the petition accompanies our written testimony. We and our 10 co-petitioners are asking the FTC to use its existing authority to fill the national leadership vacuum in environmental marketing claims by making clear what it considers to be deceptive environmental claims. Our co-petitioners included the Food Marketing Institute, the Grocery Manufacturers of America, and the Grocery Industry Committee on Solid Waste, each of whom is represented here today. The guidelines attached to our petition generally support claims in a context so that consumers will understand fully the claims that are being made to them by marketers. With the national guideposts reflected in our um, guideline document, the food industry and others will vigorously compete for consumers' environmental loyalty, and the engine of competition will drive environmental improvements by companies. Our petition includes a proposed FTC guide, which would identify both safe harbors and minefields for environmental marketing. The proposal would provide guidance to companies who want to make claims regarding source reduction, recyclability, recycled content, compostability, and refillability or reusability. The FTC has already indicated that it will schedule hearings on this industry petition and on environmental marketing in general probably this summer. We urge you to give the FTC leadership and the interagency process that's now underway involving the FTC, EPA, and the White House Office of Consumer Affairs a chance to work. That process will provide an opportunity to build a national consensus on environmental marketing that will include industry, consumers, and environmental advocates. Some have suggested that the solution to creating the needed solid waste systems is arbitrary thresholds which must be met before environmental claims can be made. Such an approach would rob the competitive system of important incentives to make environmentally beneficial investments. We believe a company should be able to tell its consumers about the amount of recycled content in its package. 10% recycled content, for example, spread over national product lines represents a significant market for recycled material. Packaging innovations, increased recyclability, recycling, and use of recycled materials must occur in an orderly fashion. Arbitrary recycling rates or recycled content requirements, as some have proposed, are not the answer, and that's particularly the case when it comes to food packaging. Such an approach would be economically disruptive, unnecessarily inflexible, and would undermine the long-standing and successfully employed authority of the Food and Drug Administration in assuring that food packaging does not adversely affect the safety and wholesomeness of our nation's food supply. The FDA has years of ex expertise in the relationship of food packaging to food safety and quality, as reflected in nearly an entire volume of the Code of Federal Regulations. The safe use of recycled material in glass bottles and jars, steel cans, aluminum beverage cans, as well as paper packaging used for dried foods and in non-food contact applications has been achieved under FDA's watchful eye for years. Further progress will be watched as well by FDA as these industries continue to make gains. 
and FDA is providing input to a joint NFPA Society of the Plastics Industry research group, which is working to develop screening methods and guidelines for the safe use of recycled plastics in food packaging. Arbitrary mandates for the use of post-consumer recycled materials in food packages may conflict with FDA's good manufacturing practice guidelines and overlook compliance with existing food safety laws and regulations. Mandated recycled content levels may exceed current technical capability and compromise either product safety or integrity. The incorporation of recycled materials must not compromise the capability of a package to protect and preserve the product. The factors affecting materials and the configuration of food packaging are not arbitrary. Food safety is paramount and specific performance characteristics are needed to protect foodstuffs from physical damage. Various issues must be addressed, such as the ability of a package to withstand the stresses of processing, handling, storage, and transportation throughout the distribution chain. Packaging materials must not impart off odors or off flavors to products. They must not interact with the product in any way that would cause undesirable chemical reactions. Just yesterday, Deborah Becker, Kraft General Foods Vice President of Environmental Policy, gave a detailed briefing to staffers from the offices of the member of this subcommittee on the array of technical factors that go into packaging decisions in our company. As your staff members learned yesterday, determining what kind of packaging to use for various food products is a complex and highly technical process. And we believe food companies need the greatest possible flexibility to make well-founded packaging decisions that incorporate not only environmental considerations, but also the other considerations that are so crucial to providing safe and wholesome foods to American consumers. Mr. Chairman, the market for positive environmental improvements in this country is strong, and our members know it. But the FDA's careful and expert hands should continue to monitor safety and other concerns as food packaging innovations respond. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to make you aware of our concerns in connection with RICA reauthorization. I think all of you, uh, first of all, I'd like to let you know the committee is aware that there are lots of things that packaging tries to achieve. Uh, our, our concern is not to ignore those other uh, functions of packaging, but to be sure that manufacturers understand that there is this new factor that has to be added to the list of things that, that packaging has to do. Um, for those of you who, who represent retailers, the uh, the idea raised with an earlier panel of of consumers asking retailers to keep a lot of the packaging. How does that strike you? We're not talking about a deposit. We're just talking about saying, you keep the garbage, I'll take the product. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I sat in the audience and uh, listened to that and over lunch had a chance to chat with somebody about it. Um, I guess I'd make a, a couple comments. One would be, uh, that would be our second least preferable way. Our, our least preferable way for the consumer to express that would be to leave it on the shelf and not buy it. Within about a week or two weeks' time, the message would be sent very strong that we don't reorder it and pretty soon that uh, product would lose its place on the shelf, but we'd have to remove the product and get rid of it. If the consumer that's the only way they're going to buy that product or buy that category and they don't have other things on the shelf that are competing that buy it and that has it in the form they want and they want to buy it uh, and then leave the packaging or the extra packaging or whatever, uh, while we wouldn't uh, advertise that and encourage it, we would certainly accommodate it. Now, to the second part, uh, you can be sure that the retailer then would start a form of communication with the supplier, seeing where together we could work uh, uh, to remove that, um, whatever that extra part of the packaging might be. And I'm sure that the supplier doesn't care to provide anything that this consumer doesn't want. So in a matter of time, that feature would disappear. I think that reflects the same kind of communication that takes place on many of the products you have in front of you of how people are trying to make those changes and respond to consumer desires. Um, 
I'm struck a little bit about packaging, though, and I think uh, you, you've covered that a little bit in terms of the necessity and the functions it serves, especially packaging with food. Uh, last week at our trade show and exposition in Chicago, we had 35,000 people there. One part of the show, we did a briefing on what efforts are being made in the solid waste area in terms of reduce, reuse, recycle, etc. One of the first questions out of the audience was a question of, now don't get carried overboard and be careful here because I want my health and beauty care items, uh, over the counter, uh, 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 cold medicines and everything, I want them in packaging that tells me if it's been tamper evident or tamper proof and tamper resistant. So uh, it's, it was a little bit of a reminder of the purpose that we try to put, that we put on packaging and all the things we try to serve. The closing day of our conference, we had Dr. Edward Chavanazzi as a speaker, and I was listening to him about all the things that are going on in Russia and so on. But I was struck when he said that one-third of their food is lost and wasted. And of course, it becomes quite obvious. Here's packaging, again, serving the purpose for us in the United States of preserving, helping us collect food, process food, transport food, shelf stability, and then carry the food home to the consumer. So there's two vivid examples of why packaging is important and there are some limits to what we can do. Given that the industry has, has, has voiced a desire to try to be part of the solution and not just uh, part of the problem, what kind of incentives financial, otherwise, do you think the federal government might give that would encourage manufacturers and, and uh, wholesalers and retailers to uh, move even farther into, des in, into designing least wasteful packaging? Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I mean, I think that uh, we could, you could approach it in, in two ways. Uh, you can provide tax incentives uh, for a limited period of time for some of these startup industries in order to encourage uh, greater recycling of, of plastics. I mean, at the moment, we as an, most of the, the industry is using as much recycled plastic as we can get our hands on. In point of fact, we pay more for recycled plastic than we do for virgin plastic. Uh, now, this, of course, will reverse itself in the car once there is enough recycled plastic coming through the system. But there will be certain what I'll call new industries which could benefit from uh, uh, seed money of some form which could come from if it were going to be directed from the government it could be uh, in the form of perhaps some tax relief in the early stages. More, more to the point in terms of what the federal government can do in the context of the total in, in, in helping to develop a comprehensive solution to the solid waste problem. I would suggest to you that uh, creating a strong incentive for local communities and the states to deal with the total solid waste problem, and perhaps the answer here is to utilize the funds that are currently available and I'm not talking about new monies, but perhaps just reordering the budget priorities of the Environmental Protection Agency in terms of providing planning dollars to the local communities so that they can adequately address in a comprehensive fashion the solid waste problem, as opposed to suddenly just getting a bright idea one morning in a city council that the solution is to ban Tetra Packs. Uh, uh, and that is an area where the government, I believe, the federal government, can show leadership by encouraging the development of total comprehensive planning and making federal funds available for the planning part of that process. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Mr. Petroselli? Somewhat related, um, but I guess in the, in the way of non-financial incentives, it seems to me that the, that the one incentive that the federal government can provide is the incentive of uniformity. 
uh, I think that, that one of the most difficult things uh, for producers to do is deal with uh, a vast array of state and local regulations that are affecting their ability to, to develop pack new packaging, their ability to talk about the improvements that they make in those packages. Uh, if you have six different laws that apply to, uh, that tell you whether you can talk about improvements that you've made in your packages, uh, you don't have as much incentive to make those improvements because it's frankly very, very difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think one of the more important things that the federal government can do is create a uniform climate, uh, particularly with respect to claims on labels and, uh, and in advertising. Is it, isn't it true that, that some of the cost of excess packaging is not cost that the manufacturer, the packager, necessarily pays. It, it may show up in a slightly higher price for the product or it may simply be a disposal cost that is uh, shouldered down the line by local government or whatever your garbage bill is. Do you think there's any way that that the total cost of the of the waste from packaging could be worked into the cost in some way so that We've heard a lot about marketplace approach, which I think has a great deal of merit. But like the nuclear industry, not all of the costs get worked into sometimes the cost of the product, and hence the market doesn't work as well as it might otherwise. Ms. Worker? Yeah, one of the things that hasn't yet been mentioned today, I don't think, is the issue of the fact that one of the reasons we we're in the solid waste problem is because virgin resources in this country are underpriced and undervalued. <laughs> it's, it's the point I was trying to make about materials are a cheap way of doing things is largely due to the fact that um, w there are archaic federal policies in place today which um, essentially underwrite the use of virgin resources so that recycled commodities can't even compete um, it is true that it's often more expensive, it doesn't make sense, but it's more expensive to use recycled materials um, because whether through timber subsidies or depletion allowances, um, the extraction of virgin materials are cheap. We believe one of the ways to address this problem is to raise the cost of virgin resources, um, incorporate some of those externalities into the price of um, extra timber mining extraction of oil um, if those, if, if the externalities were reflected in the cost of the virgin resources, the price of recycled commodities would have a fighting chance. There would be more of a level playing field. The other thing that also hasn't been mentioned, which is worth consideration by this committee, is to um, volume, what's generally called volume-based disposal fees. In other words, um, providing individuals with incentives to reduce their garbage generation, their personal garbage generation rate by making their garbage disposal fees um, reflect how much garbage they produce. Today, um, whether you're a manufacturer or a consumer, you don't pay extra for if you're relatively more wasteful than um, your neighbor. Um, and that's largely because garbage disposal fees are part of the tax base. If we had disposal fees which reflected um, how much garbage you produced, individuals would have an incentive to produce less. So those are two financial mechanisms, both at the front end and at the back end, which can address that problem. Any comments? Yes, Dr. Anderson. Uh, I think it would be really unfortunate if we focused on packaging here um, as exclusive from the rest of the waste stream. I think that packaging is only one of the many inputs into the waste stream and that on the output end, we need to focus on materials and making sure that what goes in is compatible with the right solutions and the right, right ways to dispose of that. I think that Ms. Worka's um, suggestion of the fee-based um, by volume disposal system is a, is a key way to help address the whole system as a whole. Um, I think that should we start looking at a system similar to the German dual packaging system, this would be very unfortunate. I think that this sets up the wrong incentives, focuses on an input instead of getting materials to their right end point. And um, I think we need to keep in mind that there's a total waste stream we need to take care of here. 
I, I would suggest that the, uh, in order to break this incredible thing called RICRA down into manageable pieces for hearings, we do sometimes look like we're looking at a very narrow part of this whole camel. Uh, you, you're exactly correct, and, and uh, we, are, uh, we are trying to address those other things and then interrelate various solutions that are proposed and so forth uh, as, we, as we approach the legislation. Well, it is, it is growing late. I, I think maybe just one last question with regard to, to definitions. It would really help, it would seem to me, if we could get some definitions, EPA or F, uh, FTC, somebody could do some of that. Do you think it's possible, however, to write a definition of excess packaging? Is that kind of a hopeless thing? We kind of need, if you could just say, you can't do any excess packaging and then leave it up to you people, but is it, is it possible to write something like that? Yes. I'm, I'm not sure that it's, I'm not sure I'd want to undertake the task of attempting to, <laughs> to write a definition of, of excess packaging, um, but it is possible to stimulate competition over excess packaging. Um, and in fact, you've seen some of the fruits of competition over excess packaging already. Um, and, and you'll see more in, in, uh, in the months ahead. Uh, if, if manufacturers are allowed to develop these packaging alternatives and to talk about them uh, without fearing prosecution, uh, either from this corner or this corner or this corner of the, of the country, um, you will you move in the direction, I think, of eliminating as much excess packaging as, as can reasonably be, reasonably be done. I think that's about you know, the most you could hope for. I would also just comment that, uh, as I think was pointed out earlier and, uh, by Mr. Sullivan, that when you shift from product to product, you get into very difficult areas of what's excess packaging. I mean, in an analgesic, we're all reminded of the Tylenol case that was just settled, you know, the claims were just settled last week. What's excess packaging for an analgesic today? Who makes that call? Uh, what will the consumer tolerate as opposed to perhaps non-ingestible household products? I think the, the suggestion that was just made about, about having g guidelines that could be promulgated as we have urged the Federal Trade Commission to do will in fact then encourage, if manufacturers do know the areas in which they are going to be able to make competitive claims, there's nothing like a good sense of competition within the industry that will spark the innovation that is necessary that I think will achieve the ultimate objectives that uh, both the public sector and the private sector both share and would like to enjoy. Well, I think you all are aware of the, the process that the committee is using to try and, and, and put together a RECRA bill. Uh, we, we want your input. Uh, there will be a uh, uh, concept paper that we will be issuing uh, here in the next couple of months to which you can make very specific reactions. We encourage all of you to avail yourself of that process. There are uh, clearly going to be some choices here. Uh, that will have to be made, but our goal is to do a rational RICRA bill that will, in fact, uh, help this country deal effectively with its waste stream, packaging being one slice of a very large problem, uh, a not unimportant slice, nevertheless. We appreciate your help uh, with the committee and urge you to continue to help us as we go through the process. Thank you very much. Subcommittee stands adjourned. concludes this hearing held earlier this month, and a reminder to join us each Friday for our weekly series, Road to the White House. We'll trace potential presidential candidates as they visit primary states, exploring the possibility of a bid for the Oval Office. Again, that's Road to the White House, Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, 2 p.m. Pacific Time. We'll take a break now for a look at the schedule. You're watching C-SPAN, a public affairs network of the cable television industry. We're taking a break now for information about our overnight schedule and a